Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants will be on a listen-only mode for the duration of today's conference. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to your host, Karen Battle. Thank you. You may begin. Good morning uh, and welcome to the 2021 Spring Virtual Meeting of the National Advisory Committee on Racial, Ethnic, and Other Populations. We are delighted to resume our National Advisory Committee meetings and to have all of you join us. And we look forward to a productive discussion over the next two days. I am Karen Battle, the designated federal officer for the National Advisory Committee. I am also the chief of the population division here at the Census Bureau. Uh, in the role of designated federal officer, I preside over the advisory committee meeting as specified by the Federal Advisory Committee Act, also known as FACA. Committee members, uh, we ask that you keep your line muted during this call until you are acknowledged by the chair. To help facilitate discussion, members' lines will be kept open to allow more efficient discussion, so we must keep background noise to a minimum. Please note, video capability is available for Census Bureau presenters and committee members. As a reminder to my Census Bureau colleagues, I encourage you to enable video during your presentation and the question and answer session. At the conclusion of each Census Bureau presentation, Jane Fisher, the chair of the NAC, along with the chair, Cherokee will be responsible for facilitating the committee discussion. Members, to join the queue for questions and comments, I ask that you use the virtual raise hand icon found on the lower right corner of the WebEx platform. Once acknowledged by the chair, unmute your line, state your name clearly for the record, and proceed with your question or comment. We have designated time tomorrow at 11.55 a.m. for public comment. We invite and encourage the public to provide their comments using the chat feature in the WebEx platform. I, as the designated federal officer, will read the public comments during that period. The Federal Register Notice located on the NAC website provides information on the process to submit written comments. All public comments are posted on the Census Advisory Committee website for public viewing. During the session today and tomorrow, only committee members will be permitted to make comments to the Census Bureau panelists or to ask them questions. And you can find all meeting materials on the NAC meeting page on the census.gov website. Please note, that Census Bureau officials will not be commenting on any litigation or responding to any questions regarding litigation. At this time, we would like to thank all members of the public, Census leadership, Department of Commerce staff, congressional staff, and regional staff who are observing today's proceedings. James Cherokee and I will share in facilitating your deliberations today and tomorrow. And between the three of us, we will do our best to keep the discussion moving and ensure that we hear from everyone who has a comment while staying on schedule. Our meeting agenda reflects a broad range of topics. Uh, we developed the agenda in response to the Census Bureau's need to share and introduce program developments and research requiring your attention. Uh, the agenda also includes topics NAC recommended on critical program areas. Most topics are broken into three parts. We have a census presentation, a discussant presentation, and the committee discussion. First on today's agenda, our committee chair, James Tucker, will share remarks and introduce the NAC vice chair and other committee members. Following James, uh, Ron Jarman will provide executive remarks. Then Al Fontenot and Tim Olson will present the 2020 Census Operational Review followed by discussants uh, Jerry Green and committee discussion. We will then pause for a 10-minute break. Then Michael Fien and Deb Stempowski will present on post-data collection processing status and 2020 census data quality, followed by discussant Thomas Science and committee discussion. 
Then Timothy Kennel will present a post-enumeration survey overview, followed by discussion, Seth Sanders, and committee discussion. We will then pause for a 10-minute break, and at that time, we will end today's proceedings. The MAC members will then congregate amongst themselves to discuss and formulate recommendations, and James Tucker and Cherokee Bradley will lead that session. So at this time, uh, please welcome James Tucker, who will bring the chair's remarks and introduce the vice chair and other MAC members. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, good morning. We are pleased to be a functioning advisory committee again. Um, I want to recognize Dr. Jarman, Karen Battle, um, Antonio Ellis, and the staff in the advisory committee branch for all of their hard work over the past several months to make this meeting possible. We should begin by celebrating the life and contributions of Gilberto Amaya, a beloved member of the committee who passed away on June 2nd, 2020. Gilberto provided invaluable contributions to the Census Bureau in its efforts to secure an accurate count of African descendants from the Caribbean um, and Latin America. Gilberto will be deeply missed by all of us who are privileged to know him. Uh, I want to thank Julie Dowling for her six years of service on the committee and for her leadership as the immediate past chair. I learned a lot from Julie and appreciate all of her efforts in keeping committee members engaged during the last year of her term. I also want to congratulate Cherokee Bradley for her appointment as vice chair and to our eight new committee members. I understand it has been challenging to prepare for this meeting and thank Cherokee and all of the members for their labors in hitting the ground sprinting to make up for lost time. Um, turning to our robust and ambitious agenda, we must begin by recognizing that a lot has happened since we last met in November 2019. You need only look at how this meeting is being conducted today with census staff and committee members spread throughout the country and participating through computer video to see how different things are. Virtual meetings and working from home have become a way of life. It is with this background that we acknowledge, and we will be dis discussing, the important role that the Census Bureau's Pulse Survey has played in measuring the new normal during a global pandemic. Our agenda also is dominated by topics coming out of the 2020 Census. We have never before seen a decennial census conducted under such challenging conditions. Just as census field operations began in most of the country, the pandemic brought them to a sudden halt. Comprehensive campaigns by the Bureau and its partners to engage with the American public in person had to be changed immediately. Efforts had to be undertaken to encourage households to respond through other means, whether online, by phone, or by mail. Timelines for critical operations like update enumerate and update leave, non-response follow-up, and the post-enumeration survey were postponed by several months. Many reservations in other areas were closed for most, and in some cases, all of the field operations. When in-person field operations resumed, people who already were reluctant to participate in the census often were even more hesitant to open their doors to mass census enumerators. Mass displacements because of the pandemic, a record hurricane season, and devastating wildfires in the Pacific Northwest all contributed to making this the most complex decennial census ever conducted. Against this backdrop, we would be remiss if we did not applaud the efforts of the dedicated career staff at the Census Bureau and their community partners. They all completed the 2020 Census under extraordinary circumstances and should be commended for their work. At the same time, we need to acknowledge that many people may have been left behind in the 2020 census. We saw some of the nation's lowest self-response rates in Indian country with over 94% of all reservations falling below the nationwide self-response rate of 67%. The Navajo Nation had a self-response rate of just 22.6% and other Arizona tribal nations had a rate only slightly higher at 26.8%. Administrative records and proxy interviews cannot be adequate substitutes for self-responses, especially for vulnerable populations such as young children and those facing housing instability or homelessness. The apportionment totals coming out of Arizona and other states such as Florida and Texas raise concerns that many of the other hardest to count populations and communities of color may not have been fully counted. Over the next two days, the committee will offer a candid assessment of what worked and what didn't in the 2020 census. We will make recommendations on balancing privacy and accuracy concerns, data quality issues, redistricting data, and other 2020 census data products. 
We hope our recommendations will improve operations and products for the American Community Survey, other annual and periodic surveys, and of course, looking ahead to the 2030 Census. Thank you so much for joining us today and for your attention to these critical issues. We look forward to having a very robust discussion with you over the next two days. Thanks so much, Karen. Thank you, James. Um, are you going to introduce any of the NAC members, the new NAC members? I, I was actually, it, just in the interest of time, I, I just wanted to press forward if that's at all possible. And okay. because I understand that a lot of folks will be able to introduce themselves during the course of the next two days. Okay, sounds good. Well, thank you, Jane. Okay, now we will have uh, executive remarks from Ron Jarman, the Acting Director of the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Karen. Um, and so I, I will echo um, uh, the, ch the chair, James Tucker's uh, comment that it's good to be back um, meeting with the NAC. And so it, it's been a while. And so I, I too appreciate all the hard work uh, that, that Karen and our redistricting, or not our redistricting, but I got that on my brain, obviously. Um, and, and our uh, advisory committee office uh, put in making sure that um, you know, we got new members onboarded and we are ready to have this meeting today and tomorrow. So uh, I, I will just real quickly um, maybe uh, run through some of the new members that, that we've got on because, because the staff did work so hard to, to get them on. So, so let, let me first of all thank uh, James for stepping up as, as the chair, which is always a, a heavy lift. And so appreciate you, you stepping into this role and looking forward to working with you. And, and our new vice chair, uh, Cherokee Bradley. So uh, thank you both for taking on this important role um, uh, and, and look forward to you know, this meeting and, and more to come. So just real quick, some of our new members, uh, Risa Sanchez, welcome. Uh, Helen uh, Salmon, welcome. Uh, Rosemary Rodriguez, uh, Karthik Ramakrishnan, uh, Daniel Lichter, Ihomna Iruka, uh, uh, Florencia Gutierrez, uh, Julio uh, Gut uh, Rivera, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Delaine Compton, Richard, Calvin Chang, and Gina Adams. Uh, welcome to the committee. Look forward to working with you all. Uh, as, as we go forward. But also want to just real quickly uh, acknowledge those that are that have moved off or are about to move off. So Julie Dowding, our, our former uh, chair, and really appreciate all the work that, that she put in. Um, Yolanda Marlowe, Stuart Michaels, Liliana uh, Tamai, Jerry Green, who we're going to hear from here in a minute, um, Charles Bruner, Murad Garvan, and, and Megan Mari, who's now uh, part of the census family, uh, w working with us on a day-to-day -day basis. I too will also like to express uh, our sadness over the loss of, of Gilberto last year. Uh, he was a valued member of the committee and, and a, a great character and a, a great person to, to get to know. So, um, so with that, let, let me jump in uh, and, and sort of give some some remarks. So uh, as you all probably saw last week, um, and, unless you were uh, ensconced out in the wilderness somewhere, uh, we released the apportionment numbers. Um, so we we're very happy to be able to do that. And a lot of people, um, many who we're going to hear from today and tomorrow, put a lot of hard work in to make sure that that happened. So uh, as of April 1st last year, the, the 2020 census counts 331,449,281. I don't quite have that number memorized yet, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, an, an increase of, of only 7.4% um, uh, over the 2010 count, which, you know, is the, the slowest growth rate um, for, for the country since um, the Great Depression years between 1930 and 1940. So, um, and, and you, we saw uh, some news yesterday that was making the rounds on on uh, birth rates being at a historic low as well. So 
definitely interesting times uh, in the in the country. And um, I'll just note from my own uh, research interest, there's other uh, dimensions that w which we've seen sort of declining uh, dynamism in, in some of our statistics. So uh, something to keep watching going forward. So hopefully, as we come out of this pandemic, there's some renewed vigor. Um, uh, so anyway, I, I won't go through all of the uh, the, the detailed stats. I'm, I'm sure you all watched with great interest. Um, but but relatively small churn uh, in the in the House uh, in reapportionment due to uh, the census counts. So seven seats changing amongst 13 states, with six, six states gaining uh, and te Texas gaining two. Uh, California, or Colorado, Florida, Montana, North Carolina, Oregon, all gaining a seat, and seven states each losing a seat, California, Illinois, Michigan, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, the remaining 37 uh, staying the same. So, uh, you know, that's uh, basically all I want to, you know, cover on, on the results, um, but just, you know, kind of to highlight a few key things about the 2020 census. So um, two out of three households responded on their own. Um, we had a higher self-response rate than we did in, in 2010. Um, the internet self-response tool stayed up and operational the entire time from March through the middle of October, um, a, a, a great accomplishment. Um, and most of the people who responded online did use um, the internet um, self-response. Uh, followed by paper and, and not a lot of pickup um, using the phone. Um, the increased use of technology, I, I think, was instrumental in us being able to successfully complete the census, um, whether it was the Internet self-response tool staying open, but especially the use of, of iPhones um, by our enumerators out in the field um, enabled them to do their work much more productively um, we didn't hire as many people as I, I think we had wanted to originally. Um, you know, the pandemic um, brought all sorts of um, changes, including a reluctance of people to do jobs like walking around, knocking on doors. Um, and also our, our paper data capture centers, you know, we weren't always able to have them fully staffed up because of pandemic protocols. So if you were thinking about what this would look like if we were using a 2010 design with um, sending out paper forms in the mail for people to return and our enumerators, um, you know, taking interviews on paper forms, um, it, it, it's probably unlikely um, that we would have been able to, to accomplish this in the time frame that we did. So, um, you know, all, all the plans that you heard about uh, leading up to and, and the investments and, and all the the uh, the folks thinking there was going to be a healthcare.gov type disaster. Um, you know, if, if we didn't do that, I don't think we would have gotten the census done. So I, I, th I think that's uh, a huge, um, you know, a lot of people did a lot of work to make sure that that got done. So um, I, I'll stop talking about the, the census there because I'm sure we'll get some questions, but just to talk about you know, some other things going on at the Census Bureau, but in particular, um, what, what we call transformation, um, which is essentially a, a, a large concerted modernization effort at the Census Bureau across all of uh, the Bureau, not just headquarters, um, but our National Processing Center in Jeffersonville, Indiana, our regional offices, and of course, our thousands of, of uh, field staff that um, conduct our, our household surveys for us. Um, so we're, we're involving staff at, at all levels of the organization in this effort, getting ideas from everybody. But essentially, just if I, I had to give a, a short um, description, is our, our users want more timely, more granular data. And that 20th century model that the Census Bureau still largely uh, uses to produce those statistics based on sample surveys um, it is not up to the task of, of increasing um, the granularity and, and timeliness of, of our economic and, and social statistics. And so seeking new um, data sources uh, to do, whether they come from administrative data or from 
the private sector is the, is the way forward uh, to get more um, source data that we could produce uh, uh, better statistics that better serve uh, the data users going forward. So lots of work already happening in this space. Um, we've been transforming, and that's one of the great uh, things about this is, you know, um, when we had some, some workshops to talk about uh, how, how to think about what the Census Bureau is going to look like uh, 5, 10, 15 years down the road, lots of people said, well, why are we doing this in the middle of the pandemic when we're doing the census? And I said, well, if you, if you would just stop and look, you'd see that we're already uh, transforming a, a, as, a, as we see um, right now on the ground. So um, last spring during the pandemic, we introduced um, two uh, brand new surveys sort of in record time, got them through all the approvals from the Office of Management and Budget, the household and small business poll surveys, which were instrumental and still are um, in, in helping to understand how the pandemic was impacting American uh, households and, and small businesses. And so the, these new tools, um, you know, were, were done in creative new ways uh, using, um, you know, only uh, online response, uh, reaching out to businesses through through email and and households through text messaging, um, and so just huge um, you know sort of success for that for the demographic and, and economic survey areas and, and getting these things off the ground. But not only that, we we put a bunch of other statistics out to help the public and policymakers understand how COVID um, was, was impacting our country, and so uh, you know huge shout out to to the all the folks around the Census Bureau who weren't working on the 2020 census, but doing all this other work uh, in the meantime. Um, but obviously, you know, we, we changed many things about how we do the census. That was a huge transformation. We all learned how to telework um, instantly, um, you know, last March. Um, so, you know, the Census Bureau is already engaged in this transformation. So, so this is just a part, you know, uh, effort to be very purposeful about it and, and to get, um, seek the, the ideas, the energy, the creativity, of, of all of our staff. So look forward to keeping you guys apprised of that as, as that effort uh, moves forward. Um, but more importantly, um, I, I think as it moves forward, to, for the public to start to be able to, to, to take the benefits of that through better um, statistics that we produce. Um, so just let me touch on a couple other things before uh, we, we turn it back over to Karen. Um, so, you know, one, one of the things, um, you know, with, with getting the NAC back up and running um, is the, to make sure that the Differential Privacy Working Group uh, continues it, its work. Um, so I, I think um, there'll be a meeting at the end of this month um, and, and look forward to recommendations uh, on that joint joint between NAC and, and the CSAC. Um, real quick on budget. So our, our FY21 uh, appropriation, uh, is 1.1 billion that fully supports our operational needs. So we're very happy uh, with the support from the Congress and and the administration on that. Um, you know this will this will get our our processing for the 2020 census and and the work on the PES, um, but also fully funds the, the SIP uh, at, and gets us ready to do um, the economic census um, that, that that's coming up. So. Uh, so we're, we're happy with that. We, we have a number, a number of initiatives uh, up and running. Uh, one of the ones that I'm particularly fond of is, is what we call frames, where we're, we're doing a much better job of integrating all the different survey frames that we have at the Census Bureau. So the master address file that underlies our, the census and, and our household surveys, the business register that underlies all, our, all of our business surveys and then sort of marrying them up um, through the, the jobs information that we have in the LDHD program. Um, so, so lots of exciting work uh, going on there, and, and that work is fundamental for supporting our transformation uh, going, going forward. So, uh, uh, and then uh, importantly, um, you know, we also have the funding necessary to support uh, another big initiative um, that, that, that's going on, and, and that is reconfiguring our space and our suitland headquarters um, to both uh, allow the Bureau of Labor Statistics to move out to the Suitland uh, Federal Center uh, and be co-located with us and the Bureau of Economic Analysis, 
um, excited about that. And that, but also really taking into uh, account all the things that we've learned in the past year about the extent to which we really are a mobile teleworking workforce at the Census Bureau and, and, and knowing that, you know, not every um, person in the Bureau needs to have a permanent um, um, seat that they can spend uh, a, a good amount of their time work, working from home uh, and that the space in the Census Bureau would be configured uh, with that in mind and really focus more on collaboration and, and teamwork uh, while folks are in the building. Um, but we're also uh, moving our National Processing Center um, from its very old facilities to, to a new modern uh, uh, facility. Um, you know, I, I think that where, where they currently are, uh, I think the lore said it was originally a shirt factory like in the Civil War or something like that. Um, it, it's, it's pretty old um, and the GSA does no, no longer want to support it. So, um, you know, so, so we're, we'll move them to a, a new uh, facility uh, somewhere in the, in the Jeffersonville area. So um, with that, I, I will stop and, and turn it back over to Karen for, for Q&A. Thank you, Ron. Um, actually, we can open it up at this time for questions from the committee, and I will leave it to uh, James Tucker and Cherokee Bradley to moderate the Q&A session. Thanks so much. So just a reminder, everyone, please raise your hand in the chat. And while you're doing that, I'm just going to initiate the first um, question for Ron. Uh, I'm just curious, as we understand that the Pulse Survey is actually only a, a appropriate for a short term, can you talk about that? What What is the funding looking like in the future, and what, what do you expect to happen with the Pulse Survey? So, you know, we, we didn't design the Pulse Surveys to be permanent additions. Okay, so we really are thinking that they are a tool that we deploy when needed. Okay, and so, um, you know, as the we continue to come out of um, the pandemic and, and return to, to normalcy, um, you know, we'll, we'll probably, um, you know, dial that back some. Now, because of their success, people got all sorts of other ideas <laughs> for these things. Um, you know, I, I think one important thing to remember about the poll surveys is that, you know, they they don't have the response rate that you have from other surveys. Um, in, in some small areas like the district and, and small states, um, you kind of work through your sample um, pretty quickly. Um, so I, I think, you know, to, to think about what that what they might mean for for more sort of permanent data collection, you know, we, we need to do some thinking about that. But, you know, one of the things that we just want to make sure is that there's always resources available to stand them up when we need to. So, you know, once we get out of the pandemic, um, you know, what we envision them being useful for is, is any other, um, you know, if, if there's another hurricane, Katrina, or a large scale uh, disaster, some other kind of like a California earthquake or something like that, that, that we're able to stand these things up quickly. Um, and, and get to work. Or if there's, you know, an economic um, crisis, you know, something like the, um, you know, the 2008 economic crisis, you know, that you could stand these up quickly and be able to, to measure how uh, things are affecting um, households and small businesses. Um, but the other thing, too, is also to start developing better um, intelligence through other data sources that, that might, you know, sort of obviate the need of doing a survey um, in, in real time. So, uh, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of work on modernizing our retail trade statistics um, and, you know, the, the data that sits inside the, the major retail companies in, in the U.S. Um, provide a level of, of uh, granularity in, into what's happening in real time um, that the statistical agencies just don't have. And, and being able to tap into that kind of information um, we would have been able to track what was happening with the economy as the country started shutting down last March uh, in much more, um, you know, clarity than, than the official statistics actually did. So all sorts of ways of, of thinking about how to improve measurement. Pull surveys are part of it. Um, so, but I, I think, you know, re always relying on surveys is, is problematic because surveys can only do so much 
but especially because the public is increasingly reluctant to participate <laughs> in surveys. So. So thanks so much, Ron. Um, so I, I'm not seeing any hands, but I want to invite Flo um, to, to perhaps raise your comments that you put in the chat uh, to the um, to the interim director. And Hi, James. It's Shauna Banks. I think Gina Adams has a question. Hand raised. Oh, okay, I do see it. So Gina, uh, please. Hi. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to be part of this committee. I was just wondering if you could speak to, given the priority this administration is giving both to children and to communities of color, um, and the historic challenges that the Bureau has faced with undercount for both of those uh, communities across all of the functions, I was wondering if you could talk about any plans there are for making these issues more of a priority, and not just for, obviously, the decennial census, but across the, the various functions of the Bureau. Thank you. That, that's a great question, and you know we, we are very much involved in several of the administration efforts. Um, so I sit on the equitable data working group, and and we have various things going forward. I, I think one of the key things here is to, is to really think about how um, you know ad, administrative data and and other data sources might be useful in in addressing some of these. Um, Areas and so I know that there's a lot of folks that have doubts about in, uh, administrative data in there, but there's a lot more administrative data than we've been making use of. Um, but there's other, um, you know, private sector sources of, of information that might be ha have some uh, information content in them uh, for statistics on these populations as well. And so I think um, thinking very holistically about what we what measurements we have available to us to, to improve our, um, you know, sort of statistical picture of underserved communities is something that, that we need to do. Um, one of the things that we're talking about uh, right now is, is trying to improve uh, data on rural areas in particular. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, there, there's a whole host of, of um, sort of gaps in, in our measurement system. And get, getting, um, you know, one of the things I hope that we can do with the Frames project is to really illuminate where, um, what what segments of of the you know universe that we're trying to measure have have good uh, data content and which ones do not, and sort of we can really devote resources and strategies towards you know uh, making that more equitable across. Um, different groups, and then that's not just for population data. That's probably for for business data uh, as well. So we certainly have uh, some sectors of the economy that are really well measured, and we have some other sectors um, like healthcare, for example, that that aren't particularly well measured. And and that's 20% of GDP. That um, ha has pretty bad statistical information about. So that's something that. Uh, you know, we want to start to address going forward. And, and there's lots more information out there that we could use to do that. We just haven't really gotten access to that. So, so the next person up is Jerry Green, and then Jerry will be followed by Karthik. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, Jerry. Okay. So this is a quick question um, about the leadership structure that we're um, very happy to see coming along. You know, it's very exciting to have uh, Rob Santos come on, uh, at least once confirmed, um, as the census director. Just want to know uh, the role of Dr. Pruitt, another census director, who um, I had the distinct pleasure of working with back in the 2000s, what will be the role of Dr. Pruitt as a senior advisor to the director in his capacity as a former director of the Census Bureau? How will that work? So I, I think much like as it sounds, I mean, so, um, you know, we, we brought uh, Ken on board um, to help us, um, you know, with outreach to, to certain communities in, in academia and other, other places to help us um, you know, me message around, um, you know, bo both the census um, transformation, thinking about 2030. Um, so, you know, he he's a little bit, uh, I guess, maybe think of him as a utility infielder <laughs> um, and, 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 and helping out. And so he doesn't have any um, 
you know, management role or anything like that. It's, it's at, you know, as a sort of consultant, in-house consultant, if you will. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next up is Karthik. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so my question is, uh, and it may be kind of early to tell, but, um, you know, I think what, what 2020 showed us was the importance of community partnerships in terms of uh, getting at the count, particularly with various challenges, ranging from the citizenship question to the pandemic. Um, and there's, of course, you know, a 10-year roadmap in terms of census operations. Is there thinking about what community partnerships look like as part of that 10-year roadmap? Because what I'll say is as someone who has a background in civic engagement research, a major shifting shift in the last decade has been from thinking about these four-year boom and bust cycles to thinking about more integrated um, voter engagement. So I would strongly recommend that the Census Bureau think about avoiding that 10-year boom and bust cycle, um, especially given immigrant communities and young adults who would not have interacted with the Census Bureau in 2020 um, to really think about investing in community partnerships um, you know, between now and 2030 and not just showing up in force in 2028 or 2029. Right. So, so I, I think we're very sympathetic to that um, concern and, and are, we are trying to plan at least some level of an of a evergreen type partnership approach. Um, but one of the key things here is, is resource availability. And, and so obviously, you know, towards the end of the decade, uh, we get a lot more resources to support that effort um, that, that we probably won't have uh, in, in the middle of the decade. Um, so it, it, it's, you know, it's a balance between trying to keep, um, you know, engaged in that space with, with the resources that we have available to us. And so um, that's something we're, gonna, we're going to uh, do our best on. I don't know if we have, you know, a, you know, a written plan or anything like that just yet, but that's, you know, this was a concern we had last time. Um, I, I think we, we know a little bit more about how to try to keep it going uh, uh, th this period. What One of the things I, I think that I would like to see us do on a, from a partnership, um, you, know, it, you know, from a localized partnership thing during the middle of the decade is, is maybe worry a little bit less about getting people out to do the census, because that's not for a while, but to engage folks in, you know, what are the data gaps that they would like to see filled. So, so maybe think about a different type of community um, engagement d during the early years of the decade that's really more data focused and, and less uh, participation focused, and then, you know, sort of change that role as, as we progress in the, in the decade, because I, I think we need help on both of those things, so. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have a follow-up question? Uh, no, I just wanted to say thank you, and I, I, I would just flag this as, a, as an area that, that is worth monitoring and not thinking that we only need to visit community partnerships in the decade, because I would say from a community point of view, um, you know, being told that you're so important and so vital and then being forgotten for a while is not, uh, doesn't make community feel great, uh, and these yeah. are the kinds of uh, things we, and I think it was unprecedented and really commendable what those community partnerships look like. So um, I would encourage at least the Bureau to pay more attention, not just to the data part in the early part of the decade, but the community partnerships as well. Okay, the next up is Flo Gutierrez, and we may have time for w just one more question after Flo. So if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand, but at this time, we'll turn it over to Flo. Hi, good morning, um, and thank you um, for everything that you've done, and, and thank you for the partnership that you've had with the um, child advocacy community. We really appreciate all the efforts that, that the Bureau has done to uh, make sure that we count all kids in the census. Um, I just wanted to um, also thank you for the Household Pulse Survey, and 
I think what popped up in my head with the household poll survey is the fact that you all are able to get us real-time data <laughs> um, and that uh, waiting a year or having a lag of a year or two on some of the, the data that we need to advocate on behalf of kids is not ideal. And I'm wondering when you're talking about the transformation and your modernization efforts, what are you thinking about the American Community Survey and other surveys that we all rely on um, to do our work? Um, are there conversations to improving um, the timeliness of those data? Um, and as you think about the transformation, I guess this is the second question, um, what are your plans to involve the community, to involve advocates, and to involve um, experts in the field on what that transformation um, could look like? So, so just real fast, you know, the, the, the ability to produce data quickly, um, you know, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. And so, you know, you know benchmark surveys like, you know, like the economic census or the ACS um, might not be the best platforms to think about producing more timely data. Um, but to figure out, you know, what statistics you need on, a, you know, some things you don't need on a weekly, monthly basis and, and some things you might want on a daily basis, right? Um, so, you know, statistics on retail sales is something people want instantly, practically, right? And so, um, but data on, you know, um, you know, slower, slower moving train changes, um, you know, you don't need data as frequently. So, you know, I, I think one of the things that we wanted to do is, and, and we have a, a good sense, but a, a, we could get a better sense, is, is working with data users and data providers um, to think about how to, you know, properly, you know, speed up the, the, the timeliness of certain statistics and not worry about the timeliness of some other statistics. So because we can't, we can't make everything instantaneous. Um, so, so it's 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 really going to be you know we, we don't have enough resources to do that. So let's let's try to cherry pick the things that that data users need uh, on a much more timely basis. Um, and and so I, I think like on data on kids, we need to think about you know what what it is you need to know and when do you need to know it. Um, and, and that's a conversation uh, that we can have in these venues. Um, I think it's a conversation that our other advisory committees, but it's also something what, what we just talked about with the previous question is, is try to have some intelligence out there in, in the community um, to figure these things out. So we're really good at hearing from academics and, and that sort of thing. Um, we're not so good at hearing from, uh, you know, local uh, government leaders or, or um, people in, in non sort of research university settings that you know maybe like at a small state school somewhere that's working with a, with local advocates or something like that we're not good at hearing from from those communities and, and figure out how we can get to see what their data needs are is, is something I think we need to be uh, more cognizant of and, and trying to do as, as we go forward well i I know that child advocates will be more than happy to work with you all um, so i'm I'm sure that they'll be reaching out <laughs> since right. I can't. So Karen, I see that we're right on schedule. So with that, it looks like we're at a quarter to the hour and ready for the next presentation. All right, thank you so much, Jane. So now uh, please welcome Al Fontenot and Tim Olson who will present the 2020 Census Operational Review followed by discussant Jerry Green and committee discussion. Thank you, Karen. Good morning. Most of you know me, and for those of you who don't, I'm Al Fontenot, the Associate Director of the Centennial Census Programs. The last time we presented an update on the 2020 Decennial Census status to you was November 5th, 2020. We were just about eight months into the COVID-19 pandemic, and we had just finished our field data collection operations. Today, about six months later, we have delivered the apportionment results 
and continue to work on, the, on completing the redistricting data. I know that you're very interested in the demographic, racial, and ethnic breakdowns on census responses and participation, and so are we. However, that information is not yet available and will become available with the completion and the analysis of the redistricting data files this fall. We will keep the advisory committee and the public updated when that information becomes available. In the meantime, let's talk about what we had to do to accomplish the completion of the 2020 census. I don't have to tell you, 2020 was a very unique year in many, many ways. On March 11, 2020, 20 days before Census Day, the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic because of the outbreak of COVID-19. The U.S. declared a national emergency two days later on March 13. Looking at the early data on the virus spread, the Census Bureau Crisis Management Team, which I chair, on March 10th had already declared COVID-19 a major crisis for the 2020 Census and had begun to review and prepare to implement contingency plans for potential disruptions in our operations. As it turned out, COVID-19 necessitated that we suspend and replan all personal contact activities, such as field data collection. As the crisis grew, we were forced to do multiple replans in an effort to meet our constitutional requirements to conduct a complete and accurate census, and at the same time, to protect the health of our staff and of the American public. Operations that had been planned throughout the decade to be conducted in April through July such as non-response follow-up field data collection, were pushed back to July through October. Some of those changes pushed our field operations right into the heart of what became one of the most severe hurricane seasons that the Gulf states had experienced in recent memory. As if the wind and the flooding were not enough, the country faced unparalleled wildfires along the West Coast in California, Oregon, and Washington state. Those fires necessitated evacuations and created conditions where the air quality was deemed so hazardous that people across multiple states were advised to stay indoors. These conditions brought damage, affected the U.S. population, including our own field staff, and temporarily impacted our ability to conduct field operations and make progress in those impacted geographic areas. But because of effective contingency plans, we were able to move forward and make progress and stay on our mission by replanning operation, adjusting schedules, moving staff, and continue to stay focused on our mission to conduct a complete and accurate census of all persons living in the United States. Notwithstanding the operational flexibilities and the aggressive work schedules, the delays that we continued to encounter eventually made it impossible to complete the apportionment counts by the statutory deadline of December 31, 2020, or provide the redistricting counts by March 31, 2021. As a result of 90 to 120 day delays in field data collection and challenges in our processing operations, which Michael Thiem will discuss a little later today, the Bureau developed a schedule which established April 30th, 2021 as a date by which we would deliver the apportionment counts to the Secretary of Commerce, the President of the United States, and the people. We hit that goal, and last week on April 26th, we released the apportionment counts. Ron mentioned those numbers earlier. Our original plan was to deliver the redistricting data in state grouping starting as early as February 18th, 2021, and finished delivering the state data by March 31st, 2021. Clearly, the COVID-based delays made that schedule no longer operative. Our team laid out the balance of the schedule that would provide the delivery to the states of a complete and accurate set of redistricting data files. That plan is to deliver the redistricting data as a single national delivery to the states and to the public by September 30th, 2021. In an effort to assist the states by providing data as early as possible, we are going to be providing a set of legacy data files to all states and to the public by August 16, 2021. James Whitehorn, the chief of our Census Redistricting and Voting Rights Data Office, will be providing an in-depth briefing on the status of the redistricting data during tomorrow's session. To give you a detailed look at the challenges we encountered 
and the creative solutions we developed and implemented on the way to conducting a successful 2020 census. I'm going to hand off the discussion to Tim Olson, the Associate Director of Field Operations. Tim? Hey, thank you, Al. And uh, to everybody, a big hello. Uh, really good to be with uh, the National Advisory Committee, our friends. So I, my purpose in the next 15 minutes or so is to just tell you what really happened in 2020. Uh, it's not going to be uh, polished. It's not going to be pretty. It's going to just be the reality of how 2020 unfolded uh, from the on-the-ground perspective. I, I think that will give some context as you hear the more detailed, depthy discussions on data quality, on uh, all of the different factors that you as advisory committees want to weigh in on. So I'm going to give you what happened. Uh, but let me first talk about what we thought was going to happen. And in 2019, we had three big issues that kept us up at night that we really worried would affect the 2020 census. One, could we recruit enough people uh, to be considered as applicants that we could hire to work on the census? We were at a period of historic unemployment, 50-year low, uh, and recruiting for temporary jobs, it was tough. And even other employers would tell me, how in the heck are you going to get 2.67 million applicants? I can't even hire 10 people. You know, and, and so we waged a massive campaign, and the outcome was we ended up with 3.1 million applicants that had applied for these jobs. We also worried that there wouldn't be enough ground support from these organizations that normally partner with us to urge their constituents to respond to the census. We had heard from uh, national organizations from local organizations that because of all of the crisis over the citizenship question, they could not partner with us and they could not give us their name as a partner in 2020. We really worried that that would affect the ground game. We had, a, we had a, an estimate of 300,000 organizations that would come on board and you know, urge their, their residents to participate more than 2010, we ended up with almost 400,000 at the end of the day. We also worried in 2019 that the Internet self-response option was somehow possibly going to flop, that uh, another mentioned earlier, healthcare.gov.2, either too slow, it would go down, there might be a data breach associated with it. We worried, and the way the worry impacted me and my entire team throughout the country was if it did not perform as we expected or needed, the non-response follow-up workload, the door knocking would just really grow into portions that we were not, maybe not prepared to do. As you know, the site had zero downtime. Zero, Z-E-R-O, <laughs> zero. Stuff response exceeded 2010. <laughs> All three of these ended up being, in my words, hot, 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 hot stories. More applicants than we expected, more partners than we expected, and Internet self-response really knocked it out of the park. So that was 2019. In uh, January of 20, I did a media interview, and it, it was a story that got picked up nationally. And at that point, I literally said to the reporter, I am just so confident that this is going to be a successful census. We have the applicants, we have the partners, and all of our testing and everything is ready to rock as far as people self-responding in March. And that was our viewpoint. Then March happened. Our world went upside down. The way we lived radically changed. Every one of us, all 100 plus people on this call, uh, our lives changed and the entire nation changed. So this became our new reality in 2020. Let me talk about how that affected us. First of all, 
while the, the majority of the nation, the people in this nation, were sent home, either from their schools, uh, from their jobs, uh, from whatever they do out in the public through the stay-at-home orders, we had to continue. Our offices stayed open. Our 248 area census offices stayed open. Our paper data capture centers in Phoenix and Jeffersonville stayed open. Now, we had to radically change those office layouts. For example, our ACOs, area census offices, normally they'd be a single shift daytime operation, you know, eight to five-ish. They became three shift operations, 24 hours a day, so that the people that did the work in those offices could be physically separated enough to protect themselves from one another in any potential virus transmission. I want to tell you, and I, I, you will hear me say this over and over, the technology of 2020 saved us and the people made it happen. Without the people that we had, it would not have happened and the technology permitted those people to do their jobs. A lot of heroes out of 2020. And I, I can't but stop celebrating and honoring all of the people that just really broke their backs uh, doing things that were extraordinary and in a lot of ways heroic to make sure that we conducted a census in 2020. The other thing that became a reality is we became PPE experts in acquiring, distributing, training, and, and using PPE. Prior to mid-March, I did not know what PPE meant. Uh, that might be your case too, uh, PPE, purple, political experience. You know, I did not know. I learned quickly what PPE was. In fact, myself and a, and a handful of other uh, people at Census Headquarters, we had to become experts what was required to keep a person safe, an employee safe, what was required so that the population, the public that we interact with, either interviewing or uh, hiring or in partnership, what did we have to use for PPE to keep them safe? And uh, the, the end story is we ended up purchasing over 30 million items uh, at the same time, the rest of the United States and the world was trying to purchase the same exact items. And uh, I tell you, with the acquisition people we worked with made this happen. They pulled rabbits out of the proverbial hat, and we were able to get those materials and use them appropriately. Now, there were some strange oddities that happened. Uh, there was an 18-wheeler semi-truck that was transporting several million uh, disposable gloves that were part of our PPE shipment that got hijacked. And the gloves mysteriously disappeared. This was in another country uh, on its way to a port to send it to us. And uh, needless to say, the vendor did deliver us gloves, though those original shipments were never to be found again. <laughs> I'm sure somebody found great use for them. We also had another odd thing that happened is, you know, we needed to have uh, hand sanitizer that people in the field could use to make sure uh, when they're not at a sink with hot water and soap that they could keep their hands clean. That was one of the key factors of, you know, uh, PPE, wash your hands. So we needed, you know, uh, enough. We actually needed more than three million three-ounce bottles of hand sanitizer. And of course, you remember if you were going to a drugstore trying to get hand sanitizer, you couldn't get it then. Everybody was sold out. Remember that? I see a lot of head shaking. We had the same problem. A vendor came to us and said, "I can get all of these uh, hand sanitizer pieces to you, but I can't get them in little bottles." I can get it in multi-gallon containers. As long as I can send you the volume, you figure out how to put it in little bottles. I looked at this vendor and I said, wait a second, I'm not gonna have 248 offices taking little funnels and pouring into little three ounce bottles that we don't have. 
And I looked at him. I said, you need to make it happen in the small little bottle. The vendor did. Uh, we got our three million little three-ounce bottles that field staff could use. When I talked about PPE, a major learning factor, the third thing I want to mention is field training. Uh, we overnight modified how the field staff in 2020 would be trained. Originally, it was going to be a hybrid approach of online learning and in-person classroom training. Uh, we knew right away in a little bit after mid-March that when we resumed field operations, that in-person component wasn't going to be viable, was not going to be viable. So my team at headquarters basically broke their backs converting that whole process so it was virtually occurring online through teleconferences and different uh, means. And out of a three and a half day training process, there was only a three hour window total where the new employee physically met with the supervisor uh, to get sworn in, receive their equipment, and learn how to log into that equipment they would use in the course of their job. <laughs> Major change. I do want to mention the efforts that our regions and our ACOs went through to onboard people and retain field staff uh, was nothing short of uh, epic and um, unbelievably heroic. Prior to the shutdown of mid-March, we had already job offered 700,000 people who had accepted the jobs to work on the census. And all of those 700,000 were in some uh, stage of getting their fingerprints, getting background checks completed, submitting some final paperwork, and then being ready to start training. Shutdown occurs mid-March. We weren't really sure when we were going to be able to put them to work. So a lot of phone calls occurred to those 700,000 people, keeping them aware and familiar and um, informed about what would be occurring once we knew what would be happening. We lost about half of those people that ultimately did not want to work on the census. Much, much higher than we would ever have in a, in a regular non-pandemic environment. We ended up adding 300,000 more people to the selection criteria, uh, selection group, simply so we could get enough people in the field knocking on doors during these peak field operations. Extreme efforts uh, to get us staffed up. I've got two more things I'm going to mention, and then I'm almost done. But I think Al is, uh, is eager to start giving you some information that's really good. Uh, we found that we needed to uh, really establish and use what we call travel enumeration teams. There were certain areas of the country that were lagging behind. Uh, somewhere in the southeast, pretty much from North Carolina all the way over to Texas, uh, where some of the storms were occurring and where COVID had reared as, a, as an increased prevalence while we were doing the hiring for non-response, we, we had a very hard time in that swath of states, bring in enough people on board to do the job. And it showed in our daily production reports. So we ended up taking enumerators and their supervisors from other areas of the nation that were virtually done or nearing done, and we moved them into these other areas. And in a normal census, there's always a little bit of movement like this. In 1990, there was about 200 people that went to New York City to help out. In uh, 2000, we had about 75 people that went to a particular state to help out. In 2020, that was over 25,000 enumerators that we put on travel status and moved into areas that we needed extra help. Now, from 200 to 25,000, just wrap your arms around that. That 
major, absolutely major. And my final bullet on this slide is really dealing with the enumeration itself. There were areas, and, and James Tucker, you, you mentioned this in your opening comments. Um, you and I spent, I think, a couple, two and a half hours, one late night, <laughs> trying to crack this nut on tribal areas and how we could gain access and how we could conduct the enumeration in the areas that were closed due to COVID-19. Ultimately, in tribal areas, because many of the lands uh, were closed, their borders were closed during the census due to COVID, in many of these areas, we had to become extremely um, creative, extremely uh, adept, and hyper uh, flexible in working with the tribal governments to do what was needed to count the people that lived on those reservations. Uh, in some areas, uh, thinking of Navajo Nation, we were uh, ultimately struck a deal with uh, tribal leadership where we could bring in outside enumerators only from areas where there was a low uh, incidence of COVID infection. And the individuals that we brought in had to be essentially screened by the tribe before they'd be permitted to work on reservation lands. And that was how we completed the, the census on Navajo Nation. Other areas, uh, there, some of the small, uh, small, small tribal areas, we could not gain access and the tribal government actually gave us phone lists for emergency calling and said, Here, you, here's the numbers that we use when we reach out to residents on our reservation. If there's an emergency, use this, reach out to them. We will tell them you're calling and conduct the enumeration over the phone. There was a few reservations where that wasn't working. And so they literally, the, the tribal government gave us paper records about their population, uh, people, residents at particular addresses. We use that information essentially as a proxy to enumerate those individuals where we could not get on and we could not reach people via phone effectively. Now the same things, a little different, was in the wildfire impacted areas, Washington, Oregon, and California. Uh, it, the fires were just extremely disruptive, but the air quality is what knocked us out of the park for about a week and a half. We had to stop production and then resume it. Now in the hurricane impacted areas, particularly if any of you have been to Southwest Louisiana Shreveport area, they got hit over and over and over with major hurricanes back to back to back. It was the one area in the nation that we went right up to the midnight hour in enumeration because what would happen is when the first hurricane came through, it knocked out their infrastructure, their electrical infrastructure. Not only were people gone and removed and evacuated, but those that were still in the area, there was no power. Uh, we sent up uh, enumerators to every shelter, every hotel, and every motel where people were housed and enumerated them in those locations. Uh, ultimately, we ended up a lot of travel enumerators that came into uh, Louisiana, particularly the southwest part, and assisted us uh, as we were wrapping up the final enumeration. And I might add, um, just before we uh, came to our deadline, there was another hurricane that was going to hit three days after we closed out field operations uh, nationwide October 15th. Uh, un uncanny that hurricanes would be hitting that part of the country over and over and over. Let's go to the next slide, please. I mentioned a lot of the challenges. When it came to service-based enumeration, this is our count of those experiencing homelessness. We were going to conduct this March 30th through April 1st. Obviously, mid-March, everything came to a, a stunning stop. Uh, we had to rethink. 
when could we conduct the service-based enumeration? Uh, myself and Deb Stampowski and a number of other key uh, people at Census ended up consulting with some major stakeholders in the homeless community, uh, 67 different organizations, from national advocacy groups to national service providers with local entities to city mayors uh, to state governments uh, across the spectrum. And what they told us, it, it was really interesting just talking to them, explaining the problem, and we, we threw out a couple of different options. One was a July timeframe, and another was sometime in September. And as they analyzed when could we conduct the enumeration of people experiencing homelessness, they, they, they were pretty clear. Actually, they were extremely clear. July was not going to work. Uh, it was people are too mobile during that time period. They're not staying in shelters, et cetera. And they also said that we as, as service providers, we are too, we are too burnt out to be engaged in helping with the census right now because this pandemic is kicking us to the, to the gutter. This thing is really affecting us in massive ways, more than the general population in the homeless community. They said to us September was, was a good time. It was more comparable to the spring plan uh, weather-wise, uh, and it would give them a chance to get themselves ready to assist us and to make it happen successfully. That's what we did. Uh, we selected September 22 through 24, uh, we conducted service-based enumeration in shelters and uh, uh, the, the mobile food vans and the soup kitchens. And then the night of September 23rd through overnight into the morning of the 24th, we did the targeted non-shelter outdoor location enumeration, uh, people that are in parks, in woods, um, on the streets, in intersections, in alleys, et cetera. Uh, and actually, those operations went really well. Let's go to the next slide. And this is where I'm going to close some of the outcomes from 2020. Uh, One-fifth of our more than half a million field employees were bilingual, and they spoke more than 400 languages or dialects, the majority being Spanish speakers, uh, but uh, every other language uh, spoken to this nation essentially was covered by one or more of our field employees. Much greater concentration of bilingual workers in 2020 as opposed to 2010 and prior. The field systems we used, they worked <laughs> exactly as planned. And as I said earlier, they played a major role in increasing our productivity, uh, literally nearly double over 2010. Non-response follow-up, the biggest operation, in spite, of, in spite of all of these unprecedented challenges, we completed it, and we believe we, it required remarkable execution to make it happen in this environment. The other thing that was an outcome was the partner organizations, the nearly 400,000 organizations that partnered with us. Once mid-March, it literally... Call again overnight changed their ground game to a virtual uh, outreach effort and effectively, and, and someone said earlier, the power that these people have in reaching their, their residents, unbelievably powerful. Uh, they were a big part of why the self-response rate became higher in 2020 as opposed to 2010. And my my closing thought, and I'm going to turn it right over to Al, is the Census Bureau, and, and I'll, I'll read it as I wrote it because I think it says the truth. The Census Bureau, and most importantly, the American people, achieved something that many people thought impossible, a complete census during a global pandemic. Uh, Al, it's all yours. Thank you, Tim. That was great. As Ron mentioned in his opening remarks, last week we announced the first results from the 2020 census, the population of the United States and the apportionment results. While we are still analyzing the data, there are some high-level statistics that we can report to give you some flavor of how we collected the data. Of course, I'm pleased to report 
One of the most important statistics that we've mentioned several times, two-thirds of the housing units in the nation self-responded to the 2020 census. As you note from the slide that's up, the final post-processing percentage of addresses resolved by self-response was 65.3%. Now, some of you may recall during the actual census, we were showing an operation-based self-response rate of 67%. The final number of 653 is after removing duplicate responses and ensuring that all addresses in the nations were incorporated into the denominator. And it is significantly better than the directly comparable percentage after processing from the 2010 census of 61.1%. Of the addresses resolved by self-response, almost 80% came to our Internet self-response online application. About 18% of the self-responders chose to use paper mail-in forms, and about 2% called in their response to one of our telephone centers. Six states had 70% or more of their addresses resolved via self-response compared to none in 2010. Additionally, 39 states, including the District of Columbia, had 60% or more of their addresses resolved via self-response compared to just 27 states, including the district in 2010. The non-response follow-up operation was originally scheduled from May 13th to July 31st. You can change the slide, uh, Chris. But as Tim and I mentioned, the COVID pandemic made that impossible. We successfully began implementing our soft launches July 16th, and NERFL was being conducted through all our ACOs by August 9th. We completed NERFL field operations on October 15th, 2020. As part of our initiative to provide a much more detailed and transparent look inside the census results, we were able to do, at this point in prior censuses, less information that we're able to provide those census. So we want to spend a moment and discuss the detail of how housing units were resolved during the 2020 census. We already discussed the two-thirds of housing units in the nation being resolved by self-response, but what about the other one-third, those that we had to resolve during NERFU? When we talk about resolved addresses or resolved housing units during NERFU, we're essentially talking about three buckets that a housing unit or an address can fall into occupied, vacant, or what we classify as non-existent or deleted. deleted. Those also would include what I would classify as non-housing unit addresses, such as commercial locations. Of the housing units identified in NERFU as occupied, over half, 55.5, were enumerated by a household member talking to an enumerator. 26.1% were resolved by proxy, such as a neighbor, a rental agent, a building manager, or some other knowledgeable person familiar with the housing unit. This percentage is slightly higher than that in 2010, which was 24.7%. The remaining 18.1% were enumerated using high-quality administrative records. If you recall, resolving housing units by high-quality administrative records was one of the four key innovation areas that were part of the original 2020 operations plan. As a few examples, we use the combination of administrative records such as IRS data, Social Security data, U.S. Postal Service data such as their delivery sequence file, their undeliverable as address file. We use Medicare records and Indian Health Service patient databases. To provide deeper context, that 18.1% of occupied housing units translated to 13.6% of the NERFU workload or 4.6% of the addresses in the nation, which were resolved by administrative records. Of the housing units identified as vacant, of course, they're not a resident, so 85.5 were resolved by proxy, with the remaining 14.5 resolved using high-quality administrative records, such as the U.S. Postal Service's um, non-deliverable address file through repeated mailings to the address. Finally, of the deleted housing units, 96.4 were resolved by proxy, and 3.6 were resolved by high-quality administrative records. Recapping the results, all of the 2020 census data collected in spite of the obstacles we faced showed that we had a very successful census. 
We achieved an address resolution rate of 99% or higher in all 50 states plus D.C. and Puerto Rico. Two-thirds of addresses are resolved by self-response, which gives us higher data quality, and the vast majority of households that self-responded did so online with almost 80% choosing to respond using our Internet self-response application. The IRS managed, I'm sorry, the ISR, Internet Self-Response Tool, managed our highest traffic demand and operated throughout the census without one second of downtime. And we had no successful hack attempts or penetrations of our data systems. Our increased use of technology, including the use of iPhones for case routing optimization, assignment management, and data collection contributed to increased enumerator productivity, all of which directly led to nearly a doubling of the productivity rate of our field staff, 1.92 cases per hour compared to 1.05 cases per hour in 2010. When we look at the quality data that Deb will talk about later, you will see that we have continued to assess and analyze all aspects of the 2020 census. But at this point, we're going to stop with our high-level presentation and turn it over to Jerry Green, our discussant. Jerry? Jerry, you're on mute. Jerry, unmute your phone. Now I'm on. I'm just saying that my, I'm glad uh, I was finally able to get on because my rusty dusty um, landline was about to go out. So, <laughs> but it's good to see everybody and I'm glad I could make it because I was having some challenges this morning. Uh, thank you, Al and Tim, for that incredible report on, on 2020 Census Operations. I am Jerry Green, the 2020 Census Senior Advisor for the National Urban League and former erstwhile Census employee. Um, I really did enjoy my time there. Um, I'm pleased to join you today to provide discussion remarks on, on your operational update. The 2020 Census has indeed been a stormy journey, literally. But census stakeholders uh, like the National Urban League and, and several of us are thankful to uh, the census funders who provided resources and funding for many of us to start our work two years ahead of the pandemic, and to our national leaders who fought unprecedented obstacles that threaten an accurate count. But most importantly, we, we applaud census career professionals who continue to work painstakingly and independently to fulfill the Census Bureau's constitutional mandate to provide census numbers for apportionment, redistricting, and other uses. So I looked at the Census Bureau's operational update, and you know, I thought, well, it, it's probably important to provide an al alternate view of 2020 census operations, one from the eyes and the lens of census stakeholders. Uh, our experiences over the, the past year in particular are a bit different than the Census Bureau's report today. Um, rather, they are grounded in the truth that we found out that we, we really needed each other. And we had to work together across all of our diverse communities to, in our opinion, save the count in the midst of great fear at times and adversity. We had to strategize and share 2020 census messaging when there was none and provide direction to our communities, including census workers often, when it was dark. We provided comfort to each other in our communities in the face of law enforcement run amok and amidst the raging pandemic, among other challenges already mentioned today. Our ultimate goal was to provide pathways to census participation that respected the constitutional right of all people to be counted and to protect to the extent possible, always in the back of our mind, was the integrity of the census and its career workforce. So as I move forward with these discussion remarks, many of which have already been mentioned today. Um, I still want to uh, bring to mind that we have not met or advised the Census Bureau in more than a year. And my comments reflect not only the perspectives of the National Urban League, but several of our sister stakeholders across diverse communities. Um, it, with respect to the operational timeline slide, the first one that was um, provided, it was good, a good foundation. Um, it's an important overview chart and, you know, perhaps it could be informed a bit more by including other operational um, 
activities like mobile questionnaire assistance or update enumerate or recruitment and hiring, which you mentioned um, quite often, the successes with that. And, and particularly the fingerprinting part that shuts efforts down, um, early non-response follow-up, things like that. So there may be opportunities to make that a bit more informative by adding some of the other operations that were critically impacted. With respect to you, I call it the field brag sheet, um, needing 2.6 million applicants and ending up with 3.1 million. We, too, were totally surprised uh, and, and um, encouraged by seeing such a robust response to census recruitment efforts in the beginning in light of what was being the low employment in low unemployment, unemployment economy, as uh, Ron stated earlier. And you should know that census partners played a huge role in helping to get the word out. So um, but, but that's an example of um, the partnership that we, we both did, uh, the Census Bureau and, and partners, in, in trying to uh, conduct that recruitment. It would be helpful to know, and I think you have that number, a pretty big number on how many were hired uh, and retained during non-response follow-up. Um, we must acknowledge uh, that there were significant onboarding problems before the, the pandemic hit in 2019. Um, you know, including trying to get the partnership specialists on board. Um, um, and then, of course, shutting down fingerprinting operations exacerbated prob problems with meeting and the background checks with meeting hiring deadlines. Um, the, the national partners, well, the partners, I should say, the 400,000, um, you know, the question begs, were these all active partners or were these people perhaps who called and put up on the website that they wanted to receive updates you know, what is the split between national and regional partners? The Census Coalition had a pretty big, you know, um, umbrella, if you will, of organizations, national, regional, nonprofit organizations, and it would, be, would have been great to perhaps reach out to some of these, although I do recall you all putting out a document with tons of partners on there. We just didn't know if these were really active partners or who they were. We, re we also want to uh, applaud the success of uh, the Internet Self-Response, um, Michael Steam and that, that whole team. We were concerned for years before the census uh, actually began about whether there was going to be a possible hack or system crash and bad actors. I mean, we were just scared to death. But, you know, the Internet response in the end saved the day. As it relates to field realities in the 2020 census, I'll just, you know, go to, um, well, actually, you had a slide, Field Realities in 2020. For our new members, the Update Leave Program was designed to have census enumerators drop 2020 census packets off at the doorstep of households where the majority of the respondents live in typically rural or small towns uh, where mail is only delivered to P.O. boxes or where there is low Internet availability. That's a whole heap and lot of households, 6.8 mil 6 million fell into this category. And, you know, COVID delays and the lack of clear messaging on behalf of the Census Bureau for respondents killed enumeration efforts for some of these communities, especially on American Indian reservations. Closure of most American Indian reservations during the pandemic negatively impacted enumeration efforts for sure, you know, but we understand what, why that was so necessary. At the same time, though, uh, Census asked Native or update leave households not to complete the census online without their unique code, which those households would not have received until update leave operations resumed eventually on the reservation. Even if a household responded without using their census ID by entering their address on an online form or calling a toll-free number, the Census Bureau advised that a numerator would still leave a questionnaire at the residence once operations resumed even if that household already responded. The messaging was not clear, was subjected to many uh, in, in the American Indian population that they had to complete the census twice to be counted. And as it relates to Latino households and stakeholders, the off and on again update leave operations may have contributed to less effective enumeration, particularly in places such as Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, and in border communities such as the Rio Grande Valley, Black rural populations in such southern states, too, including Alabama's Black Belt and Georgia and the Mississippi Delta, might well have been impacted uh, about mixed messaging on update leave operations. 
and incomplete enumeration too. So we're looking forward to the data that come out. Of course, we know that, you know, that, that data is going to come out and we'll be checking to see what those response rates look like for those communities. Um, training, virtually overnight for more than 500,000 employees, that's a lot, you know, and it's just incredible, really, what the Census Bureau has pulled off. It's just um, an amazing accomplishment. But the question is, how effective was this training? Were temporary census staff sufficiently trained to keep up with all of the shifting deadlines and operations during the pandemic? You know, it's one thing to throw out the, and, and have and develop a, a virtual training program, but there were several critical points during the census when stakeholders were the inter when stakeholders were the interpreters of census policy for field staff, oddly enough, or were told staff were just not sure of what the correct answers were on several topics. For instance. Were persons without citizenship allowed to work for the census? There was lack of clarity about work authorized immigrants being able to apply for census positions. Um, and then for several months, the Census Bureau's website listed U.S. citizenship as a requirement for these positions, even though Bureau staff were telling stakeholders that these immigrants could indeed obtain positions. And then, of course, there was confusion after Supreme Court ruling on the inclusion of undocumented persons uh, in the census. Um, where staff were not sure, you know, where that where things were, and and what, what weren't sure they could even speak about it. And when the census was over or not, that was a huge issue. Was it September 30th? Was it October 15th? Uh, the 5th? Was it October 15th? Was it October 31st? And it just created a ton of uh, coordination and outreach problems for our organizations in trying to get the word out. So we just didn't even put a stick down. We were like, do it, you know, just fill out that dose on the Internet, preferably, and fill out that form. Um, and then there was a question of, that was hard to, to answer, was should update these households fill out a form online or wait for an enumerator? Um, you know, just difficult to access areas. Tim, I, I really appreciate your candid remarks on this, because I had a lot of questions about this difficult area thing. So I'm glad you, you hit it point on, um, and it's important that you do that in, in the interest of tra transparency. Transparency. You did mention wildlife her wildfire, hurricane hit areas, and tribal jurisdictions, and COVID hotspot areas. Those were on my list. I'm assuming travel teams were sent to the 6.8 million update leave households in areas formerly closed due to the pandemic to ensure they were counted as well. I have a question. Will there be a need for special 2020 census data reports on the enumeration of hurricane hit areas in the south, as was done during Hurricane Katrina, if you find out that the count is well below what is expected? Additionally, did the Census Bureau stop counting in areas where there were peaceful protests against police killings of unarmed black men? I asked this question the last time we met. What plans would be in place? And this was in 2018. Should there be um, a, 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 an emergence of this kind of, of violence against the community? And um, I, didn't, I don't think we got a good answer. So the question is, were these considered difficult areas in Rochester, New York, in Louisville, Kentucky, where Breonna Taylor was, was murdered, uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where George, George Floyd lost his, his life at the hands of uh, police? I understand census may have temporarily stopped enumeration in those areas, and I, I it stand, you know, I, I stand corrected if, there, if that is uh, incorrect. But if you did stop enumeration in those areas, did you return to get a, to get an accurate to get a count? How how did that go? And then just I'm just going to wrap up, you know. Uh, I got a few more examples of things. There was a lack of optimal clarity in community education from the bureau about the different surveys being conducted at the same time the decennial was going on. For example, we heard reports from community members that they didn't know the difference between the household pulse loss survey or census 2020. There was confusion. Similarly, we heard reports of confusion or fear from households which received the American Community Survey, not necessarily because it had 72 questions on it, but because it had one question on it, and that was the question about citizenship. In Queens, we heard about activists dissuading community members from responding to the census because 
of the citizenship question on the, on the ACS. And then, of course, there was that ill-fated citizenship test questionnaire that caused a great deal of confusion and fear among communities. So all of those things we were grappling with and we we're trying to make sense of and we we're trying to translate as stakeholders, you know, um, and not getting a lot back from the census at, one, at that particular point. Um, the response rates, the 67% national respond rate, response rate, hurrah, hurrah, that's wonderful. We know that from state to state that that is inconsistent, you know, and um, there are some states that are well below the 67% rate, which gives us pause and concern about really what the undercount numbers are going to look like in those communities of color once the PES, the post-enumeration survey, is completed. Um, Jim talked eloquently, spoke eloquently about the response rates for American Indian, uh, the self-response rates for American Indian tribes and the population overall, so I won't, I won't belabor that. Um, and we can talk more about that in the discussion. And then we have concerns about the large number of renters and multi-unit buildings within black and urban communities. We're concerned that the use of proxy and administrative records will be overwhelming in these, com in these communities well above the national estimate. So we have to we'll be monitoring this carefully and, and looking forward to that data. Um, we, where am I now? Well, i tell you what we're going to do. Oh, those concerns about enumerators who visited households that had already self-responded and were recontacted not to verify data or not to clean up the data or to get uh, a more complete census form, but to actually enumerate these households as if they never responded. So the question that I had, I received was, were there any systemic deficiencies in the response matching capability of the master address file or address cam canvassing? I got called, my own family called me and said, you know, why are these people not, I've filled out the form, I've showed them my little letter, you know, I've had members of Congress call me and ask why are they being recontacted when they've already responded to the census? Um, the inconsistencies related to group quarters and the college kids and nursing homes and the like uh, concerned. I'll just, I'll just say that. And then finally, and this is finally, <laughs> partner organizations, I saw on the slide that partner organizations uh, changed our ground game virtually overnight. You know, yes, we pivoted, but we struggled, especially with the conflicting information we were receiving uh, from Census Bureau press releases and other, from other avenues almost on a daily basis. Um, we did the best we could while we were still feeding children and providing first-time home loans. You know, we don't do the census 24-7, 365, and comforting our community in the midst of just unprecedented um, events. So um, we pivoted, and we, 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 did, we, did, we did the best we could um, under the circumstances. And as it pertains to apportionment, my final statement, we continue to advocate for Census Bureau professionals to have and take the time you all need to continue validating and processing the numbers. It's critical. This will only and can only increase the public's trust uh, in the integrity of the data in the Census Bureau. So I thank you for your time this morning. And um, it's good to be back. So I, um, I, I'm just going to jump in. We've got basically about six minutes left. We have a full queue. And so I'm just going to ask the NAC members to keep your comments or questions very, very brief and limit it to one if possible. Um, and in this order, Interdeep, Flo, Cherokee, and Gina. And, and we may have time for more, but let's just at least start with those. So Interdeep. Yeah, hi, good morning, good afternoon. It's good to be here and good to be back and to see and hear everybody. So I can actually yield the floor. So my question was for Tim, you know, given the three issues that you laid out initially as to uh, what kept you up in 2019 and then we moved into the, the 2020. So given that and the lessons learned, do you see any um, changes or impact that this would have as the Census Bureau moves forward with regard to their functioning, not just for the next census, but in general, the work that you do. Is there anything there that, that fundamentally changes 
uh, the functioning and the processes. And I know you mentioned some in terms of, you know, how this will change where people work from and how do you all communicate. But if there's anything to add, please do. If not, I know we've got a queue of questions. Uh, well, thanks for that. And uh, I will say that, you know, the Bureau, the Census Bureau as a whole, uh, we've really, like like the entire world, have shifted in, in where we perform our work. Uh, in our, our headquarters, we are primarily in a, a work from home situation. And uh, it's turned out to be incredibly effective uh, to work in that uh, arena. At the National Processing Center, which is one of the areas I'm responsible for, uh, you know, a lot of that work is, is physical. We're moving things, we're processing paper, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of different things there that require, you can't do it via telework. So we have uh, put in protocols and processes that in the middle of the pandemic and continues today, uh, people are able to work in the facility. And they, in that process, we uh, have the physical distancing in place uh, to the full extent uh, sometimes this means we've had to add shifts where people work uh, outside of what they normally would have worked in a large congregate setting. In our survey work, and I'll talk about this, you know, we require all of our field staff to, to use a PPE when they're interacting with public, with respondents for the American Community Surveys, Current Population Survey, and on and on and on. Um, we've also, you know, provided training to everybody in how to keep themselves safe and also how to keep the public safe in what they're doing. Uh, so these certainly have changed how we do business today. I think for 2030, I know, Al, you've got a whole team that is working on the 2030 design. Uh, and so, you know, more will be revealed on that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so our next, um, our next NAC member is Flo. And again, looking at the time, we're really, really tight. So my, my question is with regards to the admin records, uh, the use of admin records to enumerate households that did not self-respond. Um, it's the first time that the Bureau has used admin records um, in the decennial census for this purpose. And we're, there's concern that the use of these records will lose will lead to more individuals being missed, individuals that are already hard to count, including babies, young kids, those who are doubled up, individuals who are couch surfing, et cetera. Uh, so my question is, what is the Bureau going to do to assess the accuracy of admin records to count these individuals, um, especially those who are already being missed? The post enumeration survey is in process right now, and one of the things it does is look at our coverage. How complete was our coverage in all categories and looks for undercount. And when that is finished, that'll give us an assessment of the undercount. One of the things we do know from work we have done on administrative records is it is usually a better source of data than proxy uh, in terms of getting more complete information or more accurate information. We did not start off saying we're going to go and use administrative records where we didn't have very thorough administrative records at all. We used it where we had thorough administrative records and high quality administrative records. Um, those same places that we used it, and sometimes there was an alternative of not getting any information at all or are using administrative records. People had a chance to self-respond on their own, and I, and I would like to emphasize the word of self-response. And by self-response, that means people take the initiative to respond. We designed the 2020 census so you could do it on paper if that's what you wanted to do. You could pick up a telephone toll free and do it on the phone if that's what you wanted to do. You could do it online if you were so oriented, and you could make a new best friend who knocked on your door and do it in person. So we did not leave out any options for people to self-respond. And so we continue to encourage that. When we move to administrative records, people have had a chance to self-respond. 
we've knocked on doors and people weren't there, and we used good quality administrative records to collect that data. And so we're, we're actually at time, but I'm going to ask Cherokee maybe just to ask the last question and just remind the NAC members that you will have an opportunity. We can do this through, through requests for information, but also um, recommendations that we can discuss separately. So, Cherokee, please. Well, first of all, a real quick, thank you for all that you've done during the pandemic, and I, I'm sure it was, well, more than sure that it was difficult for you. So thank you for the outcome that you have presented for us today. Um, the question I have, given the obvious gap that the pandemic has caused, I think you touched on it just now with the post-enumeration survey would capture those gaps in regards to um, how the results of how this small our end results were. Is that why I heard you saying that the post enumeration survey will capture those gaps? Post, the okay. post, uh, Cherokee, thank you for your question. The post enumeration survey will let us know um, how good our coverage was for the census. But we do not feel that the pandemic caused us to have these big gaps. When we, we look at the data on collection compared to 2010, we had better data on collection than we did in 2010 in terms of 2020. So we felt that we put things in place to make sure that the pandemic did not cause gap in our data collection. So people say that, but there's no data to support that statement. Thank you. So Karen, we will turn back over to you for what I understand will be our first break. All right, uh, thank you everybody for that great discussion. And so now we will take a short break and we will come back at 12.55. Thank you. Thank you for standing by. I will now turn the call over to Karen Battle at this time. You may begin. Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, so now we're ready to move on to hear from Michael Thien and Deb Sempowski who will present on the post data collection processing status and 2020 census data quality followed by discussant, Town of Science, and committee discussion. All right, so is that me? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks for having me today. I'm very excited to be here to talk about what I think is sort of a, a, an inside census, sort of deep knowledge that the advisory panel, I hope, will enjoy because um, everybody knows that we take the census, but this is sort of uh, deep into the the guts of how the census gets from being collected to being given to the to the public. So, uh, next slide, please. Oh, so it's showing the whole, <laughs> showing everything. Well, um, the slide is intended actually to have that green box not showing until I get through those first four chevrons. But I'll just uh, we can just pretend that those are there. But just to give you a sense of of what I was going to do, that those pieces of this processing flow that I'm going to talk about are already completed. Um, I'm going to give you the step-by-step, high-level view of what what we do with the census for back for the for the back-end processing, and uh, and uh, we'll we'll uh, see where that goes and understand and ask questions after we finish. Um, the most one of the most important indicators of a census's quality is the address list. Our census is totally housing unit based, so if we uh, the the better our housing unit address list is, the the better our census is. So the first step. I mean, first of all, since the 1980s, we have actually been working on our uh, master address file. And before the 2020 census, we believe that it is, uh, and it continues to be in the best shape that it's ever been. It's a, as, as complete as it's ever been, working with you guys, with our partners, with uh, everybody, uh, the Postal Service, uh, we have a very good address list. So um, starting that way, we, we uh, essentially go into the census with a great address list, 152 million addresses was on our address list. But after we finish the census, the first thing we do is what we call geographic processing. Because even though uh, we have a great address list to do the census with, there's, I don't think there's any better example of what a moving target is than a, a, an address list of a large country. Every day somebody builds a house, or every day somebody tears down a house, or a thousand houses, or whatever. So during data collection, we actually find things that weren't in the address list when we started the, the census. 
what we have to do as the first step for processing is make sure that we've accounted for all those things that we found, make sure that those are the right things to be put in the census because it was, say, for example, we enumerated at NERFU in the middle of May, but the house wasn't occupied or even built until May 1st, that actually should not be in the 2020 census. So there's a lot of complex stuff that geographic processing has to do to make sure we have the right addresses the, uh, and, and that we can essentially have a place to put all that population can, count in. Um, next, we go to the DA. Oh, and I'm, what I also want to do is make sure that I tell you why each of these steps is where they are, because people think, why can't you just count all the uh, people that you, why, why can't you just, you know, essentially do a process that counts everybody? Well, we have to do it and, and, uh, in a way that makes sure that we have quality from, from step to step and completeness from step to step. And so I'm going to essentially answer the why are we doing it that way question for each step, too. So after geographic processing completes, we do the decennial response file one. Now, this is actually our fir first full, raw, complete file of uh, census results. For this, we essentially match uh, every response, including duplicate responses, to every address. And, and this is essentially what it, it, the, re the why we do the DRF1 is essentially to start processing cleanly with everything normalized and all the data looking correct. Um, the next step after DRF1 is DRF2, the decennial response file two, and this is where we actually take all those data that we got from DRF1 and make sure we don't have duplicate responses. We do that with the primary selection algorithm, which essentially selects the best response we have to make sure that it's in the census. So why DRF2 and why is it there? Because we don't want duplication in the census. The next step is the census unedited file, um, this is where we actually uh, apply count imputation. So even though we have done our best to get an answer from every household, uh, there are still people that will not answer the census. And so we have what we call unresolved units. For those units, we use a statistical process called count imputation to make sure that we uh, have some answer for some, a place that we feel very, very certain that there are people living. Uh, we also apply the administrative records results that Al and Tim talked about earlier. Uh, in the CUF process, and all of that culminates in a file that can be used to give the accurate count by state uh, for the apportionment purposes. And that's why that big, grind, that big green bar is there. Um, as you probably recall, last week we uh, did our apportionment counts, and all of those apportionment counts came out of the census unedited file. So now let's, uh, we're, we're at May 6th. You can see we're in the midst of census edited uh, file processing. Um, so let's go to the next slide real quick. So uh, that green box and this green box show you what we've completed. The next four steps in this, and th this gives you sort of a handy dandy schedule for what, where we're going to be um, in the rest of the, for, in, first of all in the previous steps, but then in the rest of the steps. And I'm going to use the next four slides to go through these, um, these other processes, um, starting with the census edited file. So next slide, please. Okay, the census edited file. Where the census unedited file was uh, the, the essentially provided the counts for apportionment, the census edited file provides them more detailed data required for redistricting. So um, there's a lot more complex processing that goes, that takes place for assess, including the race, ethnicity, and age information. Um, and the, the fact that we did the cuff doesn't mean that we don't need to do something like the CEF, because when, when at the, the iterative nature of this process means we do what we have to do when we have to do it in order to then set up the next process for the things we have to do for the next process. And in the cuff processing, we don't necessarily make that all of the demographic data aligns correctly and is being representative, rep represented in the system correctly because we're trying to get to counts. So there's a lot of work that takes place, a lot of detailed work and a lot of checking that takes place during staff processing. Um, similar to the CUF, uh, for, for uh, CUF we did count imputation, for the CEF we do characteristic imputation, another statistical process that uh, essentially fills in the blanks when, when we don't have the data with, uh, with, uh, the da with, a, with a statistical process that, um, for people who decide not to give us those data. Um, like everything in our processes, we do iterative run and review cycles. So this is essentially computer processing and then human review, and that goes back and forth until we're sure we get it right. So let's go to the next slide. Microdata detail file. 
So why on the microdata detail file? As, as all of you know, and, I, and all of us are concerned about, um, the Census Bureau is required to, by law to protect your confident, the confidentiality of your information. Um, this whole processing step revolves around keeping your data private and protected. And uh, you probably have also heard that for the first time, the Census Bureau is planning to use a statistical method called differential privacy to achieve this. Um, the, this is uh, cutting edge stuff that, that we feel very confident is the best way to protect your privacy. Um, and we've built a very uh, sophisticated and, and, and uh, uh, robust system to do that. Um, the, the thing about this processing stage is that, uh, like some of the other processes before, it, we have to run it on the entire country at once. And uh, you can't, for example, run it state by state. So we essentially have to run this on the entire country to, for it to work correctly. Um, and this also includes a review and possible rerun to ensure that it's all working correctly. Next slide, please. Tabulation. So what is tabulation? Tabulation literally means turning all this big pile of data that we made into tables that everybody likes to use. Um, it makes our, our data accessible. And, it, and the thing, uh, it actually has to integrate all of these characteristics in a new way to look at them. So when, when we come up with the, the CUF and the CEF, they're essentially gigantic files that in, for somebody to use them, they would have to know exactly where everything was and, and what it meant. Uh, tabulation puts things into usable formats, but it does this in a way that has to calculate because, yeah, because once you start summarizing and summing and putting things together, you can make mistakes. So there's a lot of time and effort uh, in making sure that we continue to be consistent and accurate in, in the tables that we create for tabulation um, and in the data that those, thing, those, those products actually um, reflect about the, the uh, very detailed data in the previous steps. Um, we also add uh, some uh, information during tabulation that allows uh, data to use our data more easily. So, for example, we will add uh, voting age population uh, filters so that you can actually do a filter with our tabulated data to find what you're looking for. Now, why do we do it this way? Um, this really provides an organized, easily under understandable data, as, as I've said. Um, so let's go to redistricting. Oh, oh, no, actually, before we go to redistricting, we, we can stay here. But um, tabulation, I, I, as Al said, we are actually at the tabulation stage, you essentially have the data for redistricting. Um, it's not, we haven't built all the tools, we haven't uh, 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 produced all the tools and the, and the products that we generally do by the end, but we have the data at that point. And so we are putting out um, what we refer to as a legacy data file that includes all the data. Um, on August 16th. So this will be the first time after tabulation is done, that's when we have the data that really are ready for uh, people to use for redistricting. So we can go to, uh, to products, I mean redistricting release. All right, so redistricting release, we essentially take our tabulation products and we make them ready in the way that we always intended to make them ready with the tools and the uh, data products and the DVDs and the flash drives and, and all the, the web presence that we uh, provide for our data users and for especially our, our state data users for redistricting. All of that takes, again, meticulous work to be sure that every DVD is correct, every flash drive has the right data on it, every master file is correct. And, uh, and then we essentially serve this up to the, to the public. And, um, and uh, to me, at this point, this is when uh, the, the, big, the, the second big delivery of the census happens. This is when everybody can start playing with census data and start uh, you know, learning things in school about their communities and, and you know, planning businesses and doing the things that the census, the census uh, helps uh, the American public do. Um, so, so that is sort of a quick, uh, walk through the processing stages, why we do them, and I guess I'll turn it over to Deb now to, to continue about quality. Right. Great. Can you hear me, Michael? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Fabulous. Uh, thanks, and good to be with you all this afternoon and talk a little bit about data quality. So why don't we dig right in and go to the next slide. Right, so data quality, obviously it's the foundation of our most important objective, a complete and accurate census. Uh, knowing that the COVID-19 pandemic might pose data quality issues for the census, uh, last, over a year ago, uh, Ron Jarman chartered our 2020 Data Quality Executive Guidance Group 
to ensure we had the right focus and the right resources dedicated to addressing and detecting data quality issues. And the egg, as we call it, um, oversees our multi-prong approach that's uh, here on the slide. A critical component of our quality work is the engagement of external expert groups, which I'll touch on a little bit more in a moment. Uh, and that is certainly part of our commitment to transparency. We've always actually assessed the quality of a census by evaluating how well the census operations were conducting, conducted and compared to uh, compare numbers to benchmark. 2020 census is no different. Uh, much more interest, I would say, in those comparisons and, and so forth. It takes time, though, to assess just how accurate the census is, and our assessment of the census evolves over time. We find out more things about quality as we move through our processing operations, with, which Michael just laid out. But what's different for the 2020 census is we've expanded and accelerated our work to pass along uh, what we know when we know it, it takes time to assess just how accurate it is. Um, but as we're finding out things moving through the process on data quality, we are trying to share that um, with everyone. And uh, that's going to be part of the focus of this talk this afternoon. Uh, do you want to go to the next slide? So I think uh, many of you are aware of this work, but uh, nonetheless, as I mentioned, a critical component of our work is the engagement of these external expert groups as part of our commitment to transparency. Our strategy for the external experts was designed to provide assessments on different aspects and on, on different timelines. So, for example, first, in, uh, to get some quick turnaround feedback on our processes, procedures, and metrics, we had the JSON group. Uh, they're an independent group of technical experts that advise the federal government on sensitive matters in science and technology. Uh, we had a very fast engagement with them, um, a winter study, if you will, that started at the beginning of January, and we published their report on our website in February. Second is what I call a real-time assessment uh, by a team of experts from the American Statistical Association on quality indicators. When I say real-time, uh, think about it as a similar pace as to what the Census Bureau is doing and releasing uh, findings. So they're working along with us right now on, um, you saw table one that we'll talk about in a minute. And the ASA does post their own updates on their website. And then third, a longer term assessment and something we've done in previous uh, censuses and also across this decade. Um, we've actually, um, are in the process of establishing a consensus panel with the Committee on National Statistics that will conduct an evaluation of the quality of the census. Um, we held our kickoff meeting on Monday, so this one is also rolling now, and that work will take about 18 to 24 months. So you want to go to the next slide? Of course, as I mentioned, the Bureau will continue to do the work to assess the quality of the census the work that we always planned to do before COVID, and we've supplemented that with some additional measures. As you likely know, our demographic directorate released the demographic analysis results back in December of 2020. The Census Bureau released for the first time operational quality metrics on the same day as apportionment last week. We'll talk about those more in a minute. And by the end of May, we plan to release a second table of metrics at the state and national level. We'll also release a set of operational metrics in the same time as our redistricting data. And lastly, as always, we've conducted, uh, or we've always assessed the quality of the census by evaluating how well the operations were conducted. This is certainly not new. As part of every decennial census since 1950, the Bureau has incorporated a testing evaluation experimental program to evaluate the current census and to facilitate planning uh, looking ahead, and so the assessments and valuations will continue um, just as they uh, were going to do even without COVID. So why don't we go on to the next slide, and let's talk a little bit about um, what's different. So uh, what happened on April 26th that's never happened before on the same day as apportionment? So um, 
No census is absolutely perfect, but we use well-established and proven methods to get as close as we can. Remember, we have to count everyone in the country and get them to cooperate, and that is no small feat and was certainly a little more complicated this go-round. Uh, we check our work along the way, and we have numerous quality checks built into collecting the data. This time around, we also conducted one of the most comprehensive reviews in recent history of the census during data processing. All that being said, the theme here is there isn't just one number that I can give you today to say, uh, here's the quality of the census. Um, it's too complex and everything is uh, intertwined. So today I'll focus on the first handful of performance metrics that give us a glimpse into how the operations resolved addresses. I'll talk about that a little bit. This is the first time we've released this information with apportionment and, and reality for the most part. Um, first time we've released this type of information at the state level. Generally, the assessments uh, are done at the national level after a census. Because the pandemic created concerns about quality, this is an important part of our continuing ex, uh, effort around transparency. The metrics I'll discuss, uh, as I said, are national and state level. And this is uh, getting to the what we know when we know it. So right now we know uh, national and state level, and uh, some of the speakers before me have alluded to, we're getting to that uh, more detailed level. So some of the points we'll focus on is certainly comparing 2020 to 2010, although we caveat that with sometimes comparing 2010 to 2020 um, is an apples to orange comparison. In other cases, it's very useful, and I'll call that out. We also look at different states and how that individual state did between the censuses. Um, how does one state compare to another? And um, other uh, metrics like that, I'm sure if you've looked at table one, you've done some of those things for yourself. So we do expect things to be different. Different doesn't mean better or worse, it just means different. And because we're sharing these metrics early, it's natural for you all to ask a question or to see something and for us to say we are still doing that analysis, but uh, the trade-off the Census Bureau is making here is, let's tell you what we know and then we're gonna continue our work, but it gives you uh, some information to start your own thought process. Wanna go to the next slide? All right, so to count everyone once, only once and in the right place, I'm sure you've all heard that more than just a couple of times. At the simplest, this is what the decennial census is all about. And the foundation of that census is our address list, which Michael mentioned. This includes every address in the country, and that's the basis of our census. So we conduct the census by assigning a resolution to every address, and that's really the premise I'm trying to set up here. We have addresses, that's the work we have cut out for us, if you will, and we wanna have a resolution for every address. For the 2020 census, in order to complete our work, we assigned a resolution to about 151.8 million addresses. We did that through a variety of operations. Sometimes those addresses were vacant or non-existent. Most times those were occupied and had people living in them. So we collect the data about those people and tie it to that address. This is what we mean when we say an address-based census. To put things in perspective, over 97% of addresses are resolved through either self-response or through non-response follow-up operation. So when it comes to understanding the operational metrics we'll release today, you can see that we collect most of our data through this same pipeline, if you will. About 2% of the addresses are resolved through a variety of special operations that we deploy in unique locations such as remote Alaska or unique situations such as group quarters. And then less than 1% of the addresses were not resolved when we ended data collection operations. These addresses require the use of a statistical methodology called count imputation to assign a status and if the housing unit is occupied, a population count. So uh, why don't we move to the next slide and I'll uh, start to tell you, I think, our quality story. We've never told this story so early on, so we're also paving uh, the way here on how we're gonna talk about the census. So what is this table I have here? The quality of addresses, of address resolutions, the hierarchy. 
when we developed the operational design for the census, we used as a framework our most desired way to collect data, if you will, based on the quality of a response. I'd like to explain the hierarchy for you at the high level so you can look at our national comparisons between 2010 and 2020. All of this data is directly from the public information um, that we released in Table 1. We've talked about self-response a lot. Self-response is our preferred way to collect data, right? This is the highest quality. The 2020 self-response resolution rate, 65.3% after post-collection processing, compares to in 2010, where 61.1. That's a 4.2 percentage point higher in 2020. I'm going to move down the table, if you will. I forget. You can see me. I'm going to move down the table. Uh, and let's take a look at what happens when we don't receive a self-response after um, the mailing, and we begin to send census workers out that Tim Olson hires for us. Because we had more self-response in the 2020 census, the percentage of addresses we sent out with census worker was already a smaller percentage of the addresses than it was in 2010, which is a, which is a positive, and certainly our extended data collection period helped us on that front. Our preference is for census workers to interview a household member. Household members generally provide the best quality data because they generally know the most. I think that's um, pretty obvious. But before we look at the numbers, this will be one of those um, places where I'm like, let's, we, it's a little bit hard to do apples to apples. You can do apples to apples, but um, it's, it's not a direct comparison in this situation. So for 2020, we introduced high-quality administrative records, as we've discussed, as part of our non-response follow-up design. After one unsuccessful visit by a census worker, we used those records to enumerate a household if we had them available and they were of high quality. When I say high quality, we use records if we were confident that the data accurately reflected the number and characteristics of people living in the household on April 1st. In most cases, this means we had multiple sources for a household that corroborated that information. Leading up to the 2020 census, we conducted extensive testing to determine the situations that lend themselves to using those high quality administrative records and provide accurate counts and data. And so then in the 2020 census, we used those records in, in those situations. The NAC has been uh, part of that conversation uh, since it began. So, in order to do a comparison here, I'm going to look at both lines together, both the household interview and the high-quality administrative records in 2020, and see that the 10.8% from interviews and the 4.6% from ADREC brings us to 80.7% of addresses resolved through higher quality modes, if you will. Compare that to the 79.9% in 2010, and we're still almost one percentage point higher in 2020 in terms of those higher quality address resolutions. I'm going to keep moving down the table to the proxy interview line. You can see that we collect information here from a knowledgeable neighbor, landlord, or building manager when we're not successful in finding a household member. We prefer to find a household member, as I mentioned, but sometimes a proxy is necessary. Proxy interviews accounted for 18 points. 2% of resolved addresses in 2020, 1.3 percentage points less than they did in 2010. And then continue to move down to the last part of the table for uh, addresses that were unresolved. As I mentioned earlier, we used count imputation. There's two lines here. During post-collection processing for 2020, we added a second component to improve the quality of the census. We, and we removed a number of duplicated people who were enumerated at more than one address. This operation, not conducted in the 2010 census, improved the quality of the census, but did have the potential to leave some addresses resolved. For this reason, we had more addresses in 2020 unresolved and needing imputation, that technique I mentioned that fills in that information. And when we consider the only the addresses needing imputation after we came out of the field in October, that comparison uh, for 2020 was lower than in 2010. And you can see on here that would be the 0.4 compared to the 0.2%.
So that is um, kind of the how I call this a, almost a um, funnel of quant uh, lining up the address resolution uh, nationally for the census. All right, why don't we keep going? Next slide. Actually, I think we want to go and next slide. After that, let's so let's dig in uh, to a couple of state level tables, and you could make all, all kinds of comparisons, if you will. I pulled out a few that map uh, to that table we just talked about, or the funnel. So here, let's look at self-response. As I said, they're very important from a quality perspective, because that's our preference. Every state had a higher self-response resolution in 2020 compared to 2010, and that's fantastic. And again, our extended collection period um, is probably to credit on, on some front like that. Our resolution rate was the 65.3, where in 2010 it was the 61.1. <clears throat> Excuse me, you can see some of the state level statistics here as well. As it was in the 2010 census, um, the Midwest tends to lead the country in self response. Why don't we go to the next slide? Okay, so um, here, Moving down the table again, following along for household interviews. Uh, so we had higher self-response and we added in administrative records this time, so we didn't need to necessarily count on household interviews for a bigger proportion of our non-response follow-up. In general, the interviews with household members provide our best quality. Um, and like I said, the workload there was already starting out smaller for non-response follow-up because of the higher self-response resolution. The highest three resolution rates by interview did belong to Alaska, Texas, and Mississippi. And the lowest three, rate, three resolution rates for interviews belong to Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota. Why don't we move on then to administrative records on our next slide. And you'll notice here there's no comparison because this is new. And again, this is at the state level. This was one of our major innovation areas and we talked about this quite frequently, not only in advisory committee meetings, but in our quarterly PMRs, program management reviews. If you remember back to earlier in the decade, um, it, this is important. And as I said, we use the records when we knew they were high quality um, and so this is our first census to take a look. Obviously, we have a lot more work to do to dig down and do, you know, uh, an evaluation and analysis of how our use of administration, uh, administrative records um, turned out and what it told us and how we can use that moving ahead for 2030. And you can see some of the statistics here on the slide um, for ADREC resolving 4.6% of addresses uh, at the national level for administrative records. Okay, moving along. Next slide. Here I'll just touch on then, of course, proxy resolution was the last part of that funnel. And overall, our rate was lower in 2020 versus 2010. Um, this is not our preference, but we can collect quality information from a proxy. It's just not our first um, preference when we're knocking at the door. You can see the various statistics up on the top left where our rate was 1.3 percentage points lower in uh, 2020 versus 2010 census. So why don't we go next slide. I'm getting close to the end. Here we go. So I wanted to pop this slide in here. It's not directly uh, what was in that funnel, so change your thinking just a little bit. But as I noted earlier in my talk, sometimes the comparison to 2010 uh, and 2020 is an apples to oranges. An easy ex example of that is the internet or the use of administrative records. On this slide, I wanted to talk about a less obvious design change and one that might draw your attention. Uh, so we describe uh, what a delete is as an address that does not qualify as a living quarter, so it could be uninhabitable. In uh, non-residential, or it might not exist anymore. And we want to mark those addresses as delete as we determine the resolution for all the addresses in the country. You might have noticed that our percent of addresses resolved as deletes is higher in the 2010, 2020 census. 
3.6% in 2010 versus 7.1 in 2020. You might ask why this is happening and what does it tell me? And of course, we're diving into this more, but let's talk about what we know right now uh, when we know it. So back in the fall of 2019, in order to ensure full coverage of residential addresses, some deleted addresses from the 2020 census, what we call pre-enumeration operations, remained in what we call our enumeration universe. So if you're in the enumeration universe, we're gonna go out and try to collect your data. I think that's probably as plain English as I can make that census speak. Uh, this included deleted addresses from earlier frame development operations, such as in-field address canvassing, where a delete wasn't corroborated by another source, such as a U.S. Uh, Postal Service address. So because these addresses had no corroborating source uh, to tell us yes, for sure, delete, we erred on the side of caution and in order to double check those addresses, we left them in the enumeration universe. And that kept them in moving forward. That meant they would get mailings from the Census Bureau and would eventually receive a visit by a census taker when no self response was received. When a census taker arrived, they could take the appropriate action and mark it as a delete. And so we knew going in that we were putting things that we believe to be deletes, but we wanted to, if you will, double check um, in the 2020 universe, and so that would show up as a NERFU delete. In the 2010 census, most of these verifications were done prior to the creation of that universe, and we actually double checked, if you will, those deletes during infield address canvassing. So I wanted to show an example that uh, wasn't an obvious design change, if you will, um, and how that the, our goal to ensure that the deletes were accurate actually drove up another measure that might make you ask a question about what does that say. All right, why don't we go to, I think I just have one more slide, and I wanted to encourage you, if you haven't already visited our quality webpage, uh, not only what I talked about today, uh, but all kinds of other information that we're trying to share on a flow basis as we have it is available. Uh, you can go to census.gov and uh, right here, see how to get there. And so that will be our hub. That's where we're gonna tell you what we know when we know it on the census. And I believe that's my last slide. So I think I'm actually gonna turn it over to our discussant before we do questions. Is that James, I'm looking, I can see you, is that good? Karen and James, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, let me begin by thanking both Michael and Deb for your presentations. I think it was a very helpful overview of the timeline and, and the example of address resolution for both post data collection processing and data quality. Uh, I want to preface my remarks by acknowledging what I think is not often articulated directly, and that is my view is that in the last several years, the census process has been politicized in an unprecedented manner, and that that has significance for the Bureau's plans going forward, and finally, that post-data collection processing and data quality are areas of particular and heightened concern as a result of that politicizing of the census process. We all know that in the last several years, we saw an attempt to add a citizenship question very late in the process to the decennial census. The Supreme Court then concluded that Secretary Ross added that question um, under a ruse. He gave a wrong explanation, a false explanation, for why he was doing it and the likely explanation related to attempting to politically manipulate uh, responses to the census. That was then added to by a direction from the Trump administration for the Bureau to calculate an unprecedented use of administrative records to calculate citizen population at block level. And finally, there was a directive from the Trump administration for the Bureau to attempt to determine the number of undocumented immigrants in each state. In my view, these three attempts to politicize the census have more or less permanently changed, unfortunately, public perception of the census. I recognize that none of these steps came from the Bureau, but unfortunately, the Bureau has to respond, I believe, to how the census has been politicized 
and post-processing and data quality are areas where that's particularly important. In a sense, we now have too many people in this country viewing the census in the way too many also now view voting. So that it's not only about maximizing your own participation and those who agree with you in voting, but we now see folks who also see it in their interest to suppress or deter participation in voting by those who disagree with them. Unfortunately, the politicization of the census now, I think, has introduced the same thinking, where it's not only about participating for your own household, but in some sense, the notion that you can help your political persuasion by deterring participation by others. Again, that's not something that the Census Bureau created. I think that the politicization has unfortunately led to that. And as you all know, this politicization has more or less been defined by race. So that means, I think, that the Bureau has to do a number of things. First of all, and I think these are particularly appropriate for post processing and data quality, the Bureau has to be much more not only transparent, because I think the Bureau has been very good about transparency, and your presentations demonstrate that. But I think the Bureau is going to have to engage in more proactive communications and engagement strategies to the general public about these issues to again begin to establish that the census is neutral, the census is something that every universal, every person in the country has an interest in accurate data collection top to bottom in the census. So I would suggest that the NAC create, Jim, uh, if possible, a proactive communications and engagement subcommittee to work with the Bureau on addressing some of these issues that stem from the politicization of this process. I think much of that proactive communications agenda relates to post-processing and census data quality. I think, second, it means that the Bureau has to be even better about disaggregating the data. So again, the politicization is defined by race. I think the Bureau has to be even better about disaggregating measures of census data quality and characteristic imputation by race. But beyond that, the Bureau not only has to be transparent about that disaggregation, but then engage in publicly demonstrating targeted responses to specific communities where data about characteristic imputation or about data quality indicate that those communities need particular attention. I think it also means that the Bureau has to be much more public about overcount as much as it is about undercount. Both of you in your presentations talked a bit about duplication and elimination of duplication, and that's something that I think needs to be publicly addressed more specifically because it then presents an, the attempt to have an even playing field for everyone. That overcounts in particular communities because they are concentrated in particular communities are as important. Eliminating those overcounts, that duplication, is as important as addressing undercounts and the failure to provide certain characteristics. And then, of course, I think it means the Bureau talking publicly not only about undercount, but about under response. So my next slide, Michael. I, I do think it would be useful, if not today, but at some point, for us to know whether there are differences in characteristic responses or non-responses, rather, that then had to be imputed between 2020 and prior censuses. I think there is a sense that some of the politicization of the census process would lead to certain folks avoiding responding or providing information on particular characteristic points. It would therefore be useful to know, and again, disaggregate it as much as possible, uh, where there are differences in missing data by characteristic in comparison to prior censuses. Uh, the second point here, Michael, is just a, a, a maybe too much inside baseball, but you did talk about obviously the redistricting release being first, and you also did mention that this is an iterative process, so what you do with respect to redistricting release may then affect what you do with later data releases. So my question is about imputing age. When you do your first imputation in preparation for PL94, are you just imputing whether someone is voting age or not, or are you 
imputing a specific age because of what you're later going to release. I think, again, related to transparency and proactive communication, it would be useful for us to get more about the specifics of how you impute characteristics. I think that the days when this kind of thing can be kept within a more or less limited set of scholars um, and keeping it and viewing it as more like inside baseball are over because of the politicization of the census and got to be even more uh, detailed and public and proactive about the specific characteristic imputation process history in detail. Um, and I think the same is true about the iterative runs that you engage in to review the details, being more transparent and clear to the general public about that. Next slide, please. So first, let me say with respect to the microdata detail file, I know that the MAC will be having a special meeting specifically on differential privacy, so I don't want to delve into this very much. But I did uh, hope that perhaps Michael could give more detail about um, why this process, creating the microdata detail file, prevents sequential release of data. I know that's been a question, why can't certain states get their PL files earlier than other states? And it's sort of been clear that it's all going to come at once. So if you could explain a little bit of that, that would be helpful. Um, the next point is if you could again go over a little better this, re this iterative process and explain how the use of DP in the redistricting release has implications for subsequent data releases or going at it in the other direction, why certain decisions related to the redistricting release may more or less be being dictated by concerns about subsequent more detailed data releases. And finally, I know you can't talk about pending litigation, and, I, and I, I'm not asking you to necessarily, but we do know that there is pending litigation about this. And the question that I have, and you may or may not be able to, to answer it, I understand, um, is as a practical matter, what is possible if, for whatever reason, the Bureau was told you may not use differential privacy, whether that's by court or otherwise, what is a practical matter would be the implications of that, given how close we are ultimately to the redistricting data release. Um, next file, please. Um, I wonder, Michael, if you could, uh, no, I'm sorry, go back to the redistricting one, I'm sorry. Um, Michael, I wonder if you could explain the difference between the legacy format release. We talked about tabulation, but the legacy format release of redistricting data in the latter half of August versus what would be released in September. Um, my question on the second point is, to what extent has the Bureau been in touch with specific states that face dead, deadline constraints as a result of the data not being available till August in legacy format and then September in, in its more usable format? Next slide, please. So, so here, Deb, I just have a, a few things about taking what data quality, which I think it, it, even as you presented it, right, it's, it's generally been a process that's particularly been of importance and transparent to scholars and, and folks in the mm -hmm. field. But I do think because of the politicization of census, we've got to talk about being a little more uh, public, even making things accessible to the general public in a more proactive way. Um, mm -hmm. My first question, the first point here is, I, I would like to understand, and this may be for later conversation, but how the quality evaluation then translates in the Bureau to changes for 2030, to the extent we can explain, you get out all this data, you share it, you get the input, how does that then translate inside the Bureau to what's going to be different in 2030? Uh, second point here. So the Jason reported a number of recommendations, and I'm interested in knowing what is the response mechanism, when that will be, uh, how will it be shared to the recommendations that the Jason report made. And, and then in, in the next point in line with transparency, the longer term assessment that you're putting out a contract for, to what extent can the NAC and others know the full scope of what that contract will involve? Um, will it be available if, to folks to review? Um, and then the last point is broader point that I've made at the beginning, which is what is the proactive 
communication strategy on data quality. I think that's critical in light of the politicization and the challenges. Some of them, as you all have, have mentioned, pandemic, therefore not about the politicization, but some certainly created by this politicization outside the Bureau, but the Bureau is in a position of having to respond. So what is a proactive communication strategy? So those are the kinds of questions, again, in line with trying to ensure that as much as possible, the Bureau is active immediately uh, and not waiting until closer to 2030 and engaging the general public as an effort to counter the politicization of the census that we've seen in the last couple of years. Thanks. So what I was actually going to suggest, um, Flo is the only person in the queue right now. Um, if you could po perhaps respond to those, the only question I think that you can probably hold back on is the legacy file because I know James is going to cover that a little bit more tomorrow, but that would be great if you could do that. Thanks. I mean, respond to the questions in the, in the slide that we just saw? Yeah, just respond to some of Tom's questions. And I think the, the good thing is that we have, uh, we, I, I believe we have people that are much more able than, than me to respond. So on the imputation, mm -hmm. differences on imputation between 2010 and 2020 and other censuses, um, I believe Pat might be on and may be able to talk a little bit about the research we're doing and will continue to do. And then for the differential privacy questions, I believe John About also is, is available or, or maybe one of uh, the people working on differential privacy besides John About. And then, as you said, for the legacy file description and so on, James Whitehorn is going to go in, in depth on that tomorrow. So um, is it possible to can we get it? Uh, Pat, are you available to, to talk? I don't know. On or not? I don't know if he's on yes. the line. Oh, oh yes. there's this Pat. Hi, Pat. This, this is Pat. I had a problem with you. Oh. Uh, sorry. I think the questions were more about characteristic imputation. Is that correct? Correct. Right. Yeah. And, and maybe we can have right. the question re repeated. It was a. It was quite a uh, detailed question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for characteristic imputation, I'll leave that to the experts in population division, since they're the experts in data uh, specifications. Hi there, uh, this is Karen Battle, and I know there was one, <laughs> there was one question I think that Thomas had about the imputation of age. And I was just going to say that uh, when we go through the census edited file process, we are not just focusing on imputing voting age. Um, at that point, we are working to provide uh, and fill in missing data. Um, for all topics, for all individuals. Um, and I know there are some questions about the process we go through uh, to do that characteristic imputation, but just at a very, very high level, I'll just say we go through a series of steps when it comes to trying to fill in um, the characteristics data. Uh, one of the things we do is we look to other questions on the census form to see if they can provide missing information. For example, if race is missing, we may look to the ethnicity question to see if we can use that to help us uh, gain the information. If uh, date of birth is missing, we'll look to age, or if age is missing, we'll look to date of birth, things like that. Um, but in addition to that, uh, if that doesn't help us, we also rely on administrative records to help us. Um, so, for example, we may utilize data from the Social Security Administration um, we oftentimes rely upon uh, prior census records from the 2010 census or data from the American Community Survey that was reported for a household to help us fill in missing information. Um, and if that's not available, um, we will at times look within the household. So, for example, maybe we have data reported for a householder, for example, the race, but there's no data for their biological child, so we may utilize information like that to help us fill in missing information. And as a last resort, we do rely upon uh, hot deck, hot deck methodology, where it has a nearest neighbor type approach where we look to match up nearby households on certain characteristics to see if we can uh, borrow that information to help us fill in information. So what I would suggest is that um, we actually provide to the MAC uh, some information about this whole process of characteristic imputation that could provide us uh, some more information for you. So I'll 
leave it at that. I noticed um, John about is on, and so John, perhaps you could address Tom's question about differential privacy and the PL file. Uh, am I unmuted? Yep. Okay. Uh, so I'll start with the easy one. Uh, I'm not going to make any comments about the litigation, but I have two declarations on the record that directly address the questions regarding uh, what might happen on uh, certain uh, court rulings. Um, I believe one of the questions was whether differential privacy was one of the reasons why the state redistricting data could not be released on a flow basis. On, uh, that is not the case. Uh, it is basically the scheduling issues from our uh, reprogramming of the redistricting data. In the original plan for redistricting, uh, it was the DAS was going to be run all at once, but then uh, states that had early redistricting deadlines would have been accommodated with flow. Uh, but James Whitehorn will be available tomorrow. I think he may even be available right now and can uh, discuss it more. I will just say that the, the DAS is not in any way responsible for that, for that decision. Um, and then the, the other one that I remember, and uh, Tom, if you want to uh, um, remind me if I didn't, didn't care. I wasn't taking notes because I wasn't expecting DP questions, but it's okay. Uh, the other one I remember has to do with the implications of running uh, the DAS for redistricting followed by running the DAS for um, uh, the demographic profile and subsequent products. And um, what we have been doing as a part of the tuning exercise is um, checking both redistricting and demographic uh, um, fitness for use criteria uh, so as not to uh, leave a demographic profile fitness for use table uh, on the floor um, um, as a part of the tuning for redistricting. So, so we believe that none of the tuning done for redistricting will have a negative impact on uh, the demographic profiles and subsequent uh, um, data releases. I, I will say, though, that there is a, uh, an inherent tension between uh, accuracy at very low population, small area geographies, and uh, accuracy at uh, larger geographies. And um, the redistricting use case is particularly challenging because the geographies are not known in advance. And so attempting to um, manage that using the tools that are available has been probably the most challenging part of uh, doing the redistricting data. I, I think I caught your main questions. Uh, if I missed any, okay, sounds like we're good. All right, thanks. Thanks so much, John. And I'm looking at the time. We really only have um, time for one more question. So I'm gonna ask Gina Adams um, for her question and then Flo, if you could please make note of your question and we, we can discuss it later on in the NAC discussions. Sorry, I forgot which things I had done. <laughs> um, these are these may well be just more information. Uh, first of all, uh, Karen, I really appreciate your description of how the imputation process works. I just continue to be very concerned that it seems to me many of those strategies don't adequately capture very young children, like new babies, because um, they wouldn't necessarily show up in all of them. So whenever you provide that information, it'd be great to kind of talk a little bit specifically about that. Would be great. The other question I just wanted to ask Deb is whether there's been any. Um, I'm a little unclear about the functioning of the data quality advisory group that you put together. Would there be a way of bringing the really important issues of the undercount of young children and of communities of color to that group to really think about how to improve the quality of that, or is that already part of their mandate? So certainly, that the data quality egg is chaired by Ron and uh, or led by Ron and co-chaired by myself. John Abowd and Tori Belkoff, and we would already be looking into some of the issues that you mentioned here as we get, you know, our post-enumeration survey as our first look in um, at the data uh, for the overcount and the undercount, and most certainly that's in uh, the agenda, if you will, of that group to look at when we have it. And um, I want to weave your question, if I can, into an answer. Um, to one of the things that uh, Thomas mentioned 
um, this is the, the perfect opportunity to take those lessons with the, the increased focus on the quality metrics to move that into our 2030 planning cycle, which is being led by uh, Jim Tree uh, in the decennial directorate and get those conversations, get changes uh, implemented as we get a little bit more informed earlier than we normally would on where um, challenges were. Did we make improvements? Was there something we did that we should do in other places, if you will? So I think the short answer to your question is yes, already in their purview and then um, in, a, in a great part of the decade with even more metrics to weave that into our uh, 2030 planning efforts. So we are taking advantage not only of what we're learning but also planning in 2030 to have a lot of these metrics that we're developing uh, to be more transparent, have them already kind of baked in. Michael Seamus told me he, he would do that already. So <laughs> we're, we're gonna know what we know when we know it a lot sooner than we know it, um, if you will, for the 2020 census. And so I, I just wanna thank uh, Michael, Deb, and Tom for a very great discussion, and with that, we're going to turn it back over to Karen. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So next, we will hear from Timothy Kennel, who will present a post-enumeration survey overview, followed by discussion uh, from Seth Sanders and the committee. Hey, thank you, Karen. Uh, I want to make sure, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes. Okay, great. So I'll spend the next 40 minutes on some basic definitions and concepts related to coverage, but we'll include some remarks about the design of the post-enumeration survey. Can we move to the next slide, please? Like many large-scale surveys, the post-enumeration survey is quite complex and involved. In fact, the 2020 post-enumeration survey is made up of five separate field operations, eight clerical matching operations, three sampling phases, and over a dozen estimation parts, including editing, weighting, imputation, modeling, synthetic estimation, direct estimation, and tabulation. The many moving parts and variety of activities makes working on the post enumeration survey fun and thrilling. For those of you who want to know more about the post enumeration survey than what I can briefly discuss in today's talk, I would encourage you to read the post enumeration survey detailed operational plan which is posted on our website. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll first talk about uh, different ways that we measure census quality, not just the post enumeration survey, but other methods. So let's move to the next slide. So there are numerous ways to measure census quality. Four of the main ways that the Census Bureau uses to measure quality are shown here. First, quality indicators, such as response rates, completion rates, edit rates, Reinterview outcomes, provide information about potential errors in the data and how the data were collected and processed. And this is what you know, Deb worked, walked through some of these already and there'll be more, much more to come. Second, after each component of the census ends, the team that was responsible for the operation reflects on the operation and they write a report detailing what worked well and what could have been improved. They describe the operation in, deta in detail and document many of their lessons learned. These reports are called assessments, and they contain a plethora of information about each census operation and how it compared to the original design. Third, demographic analysis uses birth, death, immigration, and emigration data to estimate the true population size of the US. These estimates are then compared to the census counts to measure census coverage. In December, my colleagues Eric Jensen he presented the demographic analysis results to the public. And you can go online and, and see them there. The fourth main way we measure coverage um, and census quality is through the Post Enumeration Survey, or PES, the topic of this presentation. The Post Enumeration Survey uses dual system estimation, also called capture recapture, to estimate the size of the true population. Those estimates are compared to the census totals, and I'll be talking about that in quite a bit of detail. Let's move to the next slide. 
So um, I just wanted to note here that the Census Bureau has been doing demographic analysis for decades, <laughs> for a long, long time, and we've been doing uh, census coverage measurement studies um, for a long time as well. The current sort of way we do it uh, started in 1980 and uh, has been um, has various iterations from 1980, 1990, 2000, and 2010. Many improvements over those decades, um, but we have a, a rich history. Um, and in the next slide, you'll see it when we go back even to 19, 1950. Um, but I wanted to highlight that we have these two main methods to measure coverage, demographic analysis, which I'll talk briefly about, and Karen could talk you know, for days probably about, about that program, and then the PES, which I'll talk about you know, here. Let's move to the next slide. Um, so I'm, this is my brief introduction to demographic analysis. Um, so I definitely want to give credit to those people who work on this. Um, demographic analysis uh, published um, estimates of the true population size, and in 2010 they published five or several, you know, about five plausible estimates of the U.S. population size. Um, so. Demographic analysis uses administrative records such as birth data, death records, as well as estimates of immigration and emigration to estimate the true population size. In 2010, demographic analysis produced several series of estimates, each with a different set of assumptions. And those assumptions mostly relate to the magnitude of immigration and emigration. The birth and death uh, statistics in our country tend to be very stable. Um, but the immigration is, uh, and immigration is a little bit harder to handle. And so they have um, different plausible estimates, all of which are equally valid, um, that they produce. And one of the strengths of demographic analysis is that the estimates are very timely and they don't depend on the census count. So for 2020, the demographic analysis numbers were released in December before we got the apportionment counts out. Um, now, one of the limitations of demographic analysis is that it's limited in the number of detailed demographic breakdowns that can be provided. Uh, and the post enumeration survey um, is not as, as timely as demographic analysis, um, but it will provide more detailed portrait of census coverage. So this is sort of our first glimpse. And then the post enumeration survey is going to come in and provide another set of uh, an estimate for um, the true population size and more detailed um, information about, uh, about the coverage of our, of our nation and of our census. So we'll move to the next slide. A few definitions here. I am a, a statistician, so I have to talk about definitions, and I'll even show you a formula later on. Um, net coverage is the difference between the census count and the true population size. If net coverage is negative, we say there was an undercount because the census count was less than a true population size. On the other hand, we say there was an overcount if uh, net coverage is positive. In the past, the post enumeration survey produced estimates of the undercount, which had the opposite sign as net coverage error. However, to be consistent with demographic analysis and the broader statistical community for 2020, we have adopted a more standard definition of net coverage error, which has reverse signs as was previously presented in census coverage uh, work based on surveys. So in the past, a positive undercount indicated the census was below the true population. Now a positive net coverage error will indicate the census was above the true population size, and we are now consistent with demographic analysis. So I hope this will uh, align us better. Uh, although the formula you see here for net coverage error is simple, estimating it is extremely challenging. I think you are all well aware of the challenges and great expense put into conducting the census to create the census count. Um, estimating the true population size is also difficult and the key job of both demographic analysis and the post enumeration survey. For 2020, demographic analysis has already published three plausible estimates of the true population size uh, that can be plugged into this formula. When complete, the post enumeration survey will publish another estimate of the true population size. Let's move to the next slide. Here are some basic historic counts of net coverage error and percent net coverage using past post enumeration surveys. Reading from the bottom to the top, we see that in 1990 census 
add an undercount. It should have included an additional 3,994,000 people. On the other hand, Census 2000 had an overcount. And I'll note that the census count might be a little bit different um, than other publications uh, that you will be familiar, you might be familiar with because the PDS uses a different universe than other um, than what is uh, typically produced in the main uh, report release. So we do not include group quarters in remote Alaska, for example, in, in 2010. So that's why the 300 million number is not what you might expect from uh, just reading uh, various reports from Census 2010. Let's move to the next slide here. Uh, here we see just a graphical depiction of the previous table. The error bars show um, the 90% confidence interval. And since the size of the true population is estimated from the PES, the estimates are subject to sampling and non-sampling errors. So I just wanted to recognize that this estimate of the true population is an estimate and subject to you know, sampling and also non-sampling errors. All right, let's move to the next slide. Here's one of the main tables produced from the post enumeration survey. And again, this data is from 2010. We have not finished our work yet. So uh, we don't have any numbers from, uh, from 2020 yet. Um, at the top of this table, we see the census count excluding people in group quarters and remote Alaska. The table also excludes people in Puerto Rico. Of the roughly 300 million person enumerations in the 2010 census, about 285 million were correct. 10 million were erroneous, and 6 million were imputations. In 2010, most of the erroneous enumerations were duplicates. And then about uh, maybe 60% of the way down the table, um, you see the estimate of the population. That's a dual system estimate of the true population size. That's the main, you know, what we think is the true population from the, the post enumeration survey. And that uh, estimate was about 300 million, uh, 700,000 people. Of those, about 285 million were correctly enumerated in the census. That's just repeated from the, the upper part of the table. Um, and then the, the difference between those two, the 16 million people, um, were not correctly enumerated in the census. We call those omissions. In looking at the standard errors, we see that the census count and the whole person imputations are known with certainty. certainty. We can just take the census file we know exactly how many imputations <laughs> there were, so we, we count those up. We know the census count. There's no sampling uh, in the census. We just aggregate those out. Those do not have any sampling error. But the other statistics you can see have, have standard errors, and those will be measured from the person enumeration survey and subject to both sampling and non-sampling errors. Um, for the 2020 census, you can expect a similar breakdown of coverage once the 2020 PES ends. Let's move to the next slide. So now I'm going to go into some more detail about the post enumeration survey um, and its design and dual system estimation. So let's move to the next slide here. The post enumeration survey measures the coverage of people and housing units in the census. It provides both measures of net coverage error and components of coverage. Data are used by stakeholders to assess the success of the census. Internal Census Bureau stakeholders also use the PES data to inform plans for the next census. The PES starts with a sample of blocks across the country. As a part of the PES, housing units and people in those blocks are listed from scratch um, and independent of the census. The people and housing units in the PES are then matched to the census. After this matching, the PES and the census data are combined together using dual system estimation, also known as capture and capture, to produce precise estimates of the true population size. The Census Bureau has been conducting a post enumeration survey since actually it was 1950. They had the first post enumeration survey, but they didn't use dual, assist, dual system estimation uh, uh, back then. It wasn't until 1980 when they adopted dual system estimation to measure the true population size. So that's, uh, let's move to the next slide. And I just wanted to reiterate, um, for a variety of reasons, the Census Bureau excludes two groups from the post enumeration survey, group quarters and people in group quarters and then remote Alaska. And this has to do with the assumptions of the um, dual system estimation make it extremely complicated and error prone to measure 
the coverage of, of these groups. Next slide. Okay, I'll walk through basically the, uh, the sampling that we do. So um, we select blocks, but the technical internal census speak is basic collection unit. That's our word for a block. They roughly correspond to a city block in, in, uh, in cities. We um, have a sample. We selected about uh, 9,800 of these blocks across the 50 states and, and D.C., and then uh, Puerto Rico had about 400 basic collection units or blocks uh, selected. And then we go out independent, you know, of the census from scratch. We send people to list um, all the addresses that you can find in these, these blocks. So as a result of the, uh, this listing operation, they listed about uh, 510,000 housing units addresses in the 50 states and, and D.C. and 18,000 in Puerto Rico. And then we do a variety of subsampling um, after that, and we, and we also review the listings and we scrutinize them uh, we want good housing units, so sometimes they may list uh, something that's not a housing unit that's still, um, you know, demolished or something like that. They're not quite sure about. So we review those and do a lot of follow-up, you know, both in the field and in various matching operations and subsampling to get down to a uh, roughly final sample of about 161,000 housing units in the 50 states and, and D.C., and then about 7,100 in, in Puerto Rico. So that's sort of our, our sample size. This is all independent of the census. People are doing this from scratch. You know, they get blank maps and just write down all the addresses in these, uh, you know, 10,000 blocks, basically. Okay, let's move to the next slide. So for dual system estimation, there are two systems or two independent samples <laughs> or lists. In wildlife surveys, the first enumeration is called the capture sample. Uh, it's the first enumeration. In the post-enumeration survey program, uh, it's called the enumeration sample uh, or the e-sample. And it's a probability sample of people and housing units uh, that were included in the census. So we go to the census, here's our 10,000 blocks, tell us all the people and housing units in those blocks. That's sort of our first uh, listing, our first system. A second enumeration is called the recapture list in wildlife surveys uh, for the PES. It's called the population sample or the P sample. So you can think P for population or PES, E for enumeration or you know, census. Um, so for the, um, for the PES, the P sample is an enumeration of housing units and people that's independent of the census enumeration done from scratch. So the PES recanvases relist, re-enumerates all of the housing units and then all the people in those housing units um, in the, the 10,000 sample blocks from scratch to form this recapture list. Through a process called dual system estimation, these two lists are combined to estimate the true population size. And that is done in a way that's better than any individual effort could do alone. So we know the census has some errors, we know the PES has some errors. When we combine them, we can mitigate these errors with a, a, an assumption of uh, independence. And uh, it's a it's wonderful project because, you know, really the sum is better than the part. PES, census, both flaws, put them together, come up with, you know, a really great measure of the true population size. It's also subject to sampling error and non-sampling error too. But putting these two um, systems together really uh, gives us a great advantage over each system alone. So let's move to the next slide, and this is where I'll get you know, in more <laughs> detail about dual system estimation. Um, so the person enumeration survey uses a method, you know, I, I'm gonna be redundant here because it's you know, so crucial to the work of the PES and very important to understand this methodology, I think, to really get into the person enumeration survey. I'm also very passionate about it, and I listen to just go on and on, as many people uh, uh, do, as uh, you know, about subjects they're passionate with. So the PES uh, uses this capture, recapture, dual system estimation to measure the true population size. And because dual system estimation is so interesting and central, you know, I'll take a few moments to walk through how it works. 
I'll first describe um, the, the method, um, as is commonly used in animal populations, and then I'll discuss how the method is used uh, for, for our census work. So the capture-recapture method was first used in the 1800s to determine the number of fish in a pond. Biologists catch a net full of fish in sample areas around the pond, and uh, this catch is called the capture. After marking the fish with a tag that they had just caught, the biologists release the fish back into the water. And after giving the fish time to swim around and get all mixed up, the biologists then put the net back into the pond at the same sample areas. Um, and the second catch then is called the recapture. The biologists count the number of fish in the recapture and the total number of fish in the recapture that had a tag on them. So they count those with and without a tag. And note the, you know, the numbers separately, those with and without a tag. And with these counts, the biologists create a table like the one shown here. Um, it uses statistics to determine the total fish uh, in the pond. The capture recapture method has been extended to uh, estimate the size of the human population. From the 2020 CES, the capture is the census, the recapture is just the independent survey or the P sample. Uh, first, we select you know, for the, uh, the survey work we do of uh, human populations, we select a sample of blocks. Um, we form a table like the one shown here for each sample area, and everybody in our sample block fits into one of these four boxes. The first row shows the people who are enumerated or counted in the census. The bottom row shows those people who are not counted in the census. Um, pity them. Uh, it, uh, the post enumeration survey is like the, the capture, the recapture, where we do a separate and independent enumeration of our sample from areas uh, from scratch. The first column shows the people who are counted in the PES, and the second column shows the people um, in the sample area who are not counted in the PES. Um, we're always very disappointed when we don't count people. So we always try to maximize the people in that top left corner. And if we can't do that, we try to get as many people, at least in the, the purple areas. And we just, you know, are very sad when, when there is an undercount and we have you know, people in that fourth box in red, but it's sort of inevitable that it's going to happen. After we match the people in the post enumeration survey to the census, we can put everybody in the census and the PES into one of these green or purple boxes in the table. Within our sample areas, most people are, are enumerated in the census and the PES, and that's our, our green box. Of course, there are some people who are enumerated in just one in the census or just the PES, but not both, and these people are um, in just one survey. They're shown in purple. And then lastly, we have the, the people in the red. Um, these people are uh, in the red cell in the lower right. Under an assumption of independence between the census and the PES, we use basic statistics and algebra to determine the number of people in the red cell. Adding up the people, so one, that's the estimation that we do, it's come up with that red cell through independence, algebra, and statistics. And then adding up the people in these four cells um, and weighting them up gives us an estimate of the true population size. So let's move to the next, uh, next slide. So here is the actual formula that we use to estimate the true population size of housing units. I'm not going to walk through the formula, um, but I do want to note that much effort is put into determining two things. The first thing um, is the percent of census enumerations that are correct. So you'll see like a little um, pie, or it looks, <laughs> I guess it's sort of contorted in this um, slide, but it should be a a pi sub CE, those are the correct enumerations in the census. So we spent a lot of work trying to determine who was correctly enumerated in the census within our sample areas. And then the second thing we put a huge amount of effort into is those people who are in the P sample, who among those, that group matched to the census. So there's these two sort of efforts, one to get, find out who in the census was correctly enumerated and who was a duplicate or erroneous enumerated and then among the P sample side, who matches to the census? And those are the, the main quantities that we need to estimate, we, we strive uh, to estimate to the PES. Let's move to the next slide. That's, um, and I'll go through sort of what we can look forward to in the future. Um, 
our schedule and uh, some of the reports that we'll be releasing. So let's move to the next slide. As a result of COVID-19, the PES revised its milestone schedule. Um, here are the original dates for the five field operations and the revised dates. Now these dates include both the main operation as well as our quality control operations, which typically lag behind the main survey uh, for about a week. As you can see, the independent listing data collection dates were not impacted by COVID-19. However, the remaining operations were delayed. Additionally, the person interview field operation uh, for that one, um, that's where the, the PES knocks on our P sample addresses and we ask who lives in this house. So it's a, a rostering of the people in the, um, the P sample housing units. Um, a number of these areas were closed in November and, uh, and December during the um, primary data collection period for the person interview. And so we reopened that um, field operation in February and March to increase our response uh, after some areas opened up for us. Um, we're looking forward now uh, to two more field operations. Uh, those remaining field operations uh, serve two my primary purposes. Uh, first, to follow up on people and housing units to determine who was correctly counted in the census. And secondly, to collect more information if we didn't have enough information to determine if a person or housing unit in the PES matched to the census or not. Um, these are the, the new dates are our planned dates. I'm very happy that, you know, right now we're a little bit ahead of schedule. So we might get to the field for the person follow-up before the 14th. It could be as early as the 1st of June. Um, but we have a lot of work to do yet, and this phase coming up for our person follow-up and all the matching that's involved in that, there's so much to do. Um, we might go beyond the, um, the date in August 14th into, or August 12th into, into early September. So just so you know, these are our planned dates that we have, but there's some, you know, uh, work that needs to be done and things may start a little bit earlier or end a little bit later, but this is what we're, we're striving for uh, right now. So those are our uh, high level for the schedule of our field, field work. Then we'll be knocking on doors and talking to our wonderful respondents. Uh, next slide. So um, what can you expect from, from these reports? So um, we have sort of three main groups uh, that we'll be showing the uh, coverage rates for, these net coverage rates, and also the components of coverage. And I didn't clearly state this, but the components of coverage would be the erroneous enumerations, correct enumerations, full person imputations, and um, omissions. Those are sort of the main components of coverage. So we'll be producing those statistics as well as just the comparison between the true population size and the census count for these um, demographic uh, variables breakdown. So age group, age group by sex, sex, uh, race and Hispanic origin tables, relationship to household or tenure. Those are sort of our basic um, categories. And there'll be very similar breakdowns that we had in, in uh, 2010. Geographic areas, we're um, planning to produce uh, uh, coverage rates for region and state. And then we have a slew of operations. These um, provide a wealth of information about sort of the success of the operations um, and uh, you know, what we could do better in the future. Um, they're not as sort of glamorous maybe as the, the demographic tables, but they're very important and useful for us for planning um, for the uh, for 2030. Um, so you can see some of those um, internal tables and will be, you know, they're, they're public, will be, will be public as well. So we're not, um, we, we use them internally a lot, but we feel very confident that we will share them with the public just like we did in, in 2010 um, as well. So you can look forward uh, to those, you know, but we have to get through <laughs> two more field operations and lots of matching work yet before we can get uh, get to that point. And we have to do a lot of estimation as well. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, we will have two, two re releases for our reports. Um, the first report will be the National Demographic 
uh, tables for, for people, um, and they'll have um, components of coverage and net coverage by those main demographic groups. Um, and you'll be able to download them for the, uh, you'll be able to download the reports like you did in 2010, but we'll also have the data up on the census website and you can download it into an Excel file. So that's sort of, you know, a very small thing that we're doing, but I think it'll make the data more useful and, you know, more accessible to the public um, if you can actually download the, uh, the tables from the, um, from the website. So the first, first release is sort of national demographic person data. Everything else is going to be in the second release. So it's going to be a fairly large release. It's going to have our housing unit, um, coverage estimates. Uh, it'll have state tables and some more of the, uh, the detailed um, breakdowns. Um, and it will include Puerto Rico uh, in that second, second release as well. Um, so these are the, the two releases that we're, we're moving towards. And I'll move to the next slide then. In addition to these, you know, the, the glamorous <laughs> coverage rates that we'll be uh, releasing, uh, we feel very strongly that we, um, we must provide information about the quality of our estimates and the methodology that we use. So um, we'll be producing a source and accuracy statement uh, for that first release and about the, the national person estimates. And then the second release, uh, we'll be uh, providing reports on the design of our methodology, reports about how we impute characteristics, um, and you know, tables about how many characteristics were imputed, and then missing data. You know, uh, I told you about our two main key uh, uh, um, things that we're focused on, the correct enumeration rate and the match rate, well, sometimes we don't, uh, we're not able, even though we do all these matching and follow-up activities, we, we can't, um, we don't have that information. They're not resolved, <laughs> to use Deb's term, and so we impute them. And so we spend a lot of effort into um, to having methodologies that will impute whether a P-sample case matched to the census or whether a, a person or housing in the census was correctly enumerated or not. And that is documented in the methodology, in the, the missing data um, memo. And then uh, we have some methodology memos on net coverage error and or net coverage estimation, what, you know, the full slew of our estimation procedures. You know, we talked about our synthetic estimation, direct estimation, um, weighting, non-response adjustment, imputation, tabulation, <laughs> that all goes into these uh, net coverage estimation and components of, of uh, coverage estimation reports. Um, and we have some similar documents like that from 2010. So uh, our methodology has not changed that much. So you can get a very good view of what we're planning to do um, from the 2010 memos, but we, we have made a few changes um, that will be definitely noted in those reports. And then um, also new for 2020 is the source and accuracy statement, which is a, sort of a standard across the, uh, the government now and the, the Census Bureau. So look forward to, to those documents um, in the second release. And then, uh, let's see, I think I have uh, some references on the next slide and uh, questions for the NAC um, after, after that. So we can move to the next slide. Uh, you know, I would be very curious in knowing um, how you've used PDF data in the past and how you think the Census Bureau should use the, uh, you know, PES data um, for the future. So those are sort of some of the questions I have. Maybe I'll pass it to our discussant um, before we get to the Q&A. Okay, should, should I go ahead? Okay, um, well, thank you for having me today. Um, uh, can, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so uh, I, I thought I'd talk very briefly and then let, let there be plenty of time for discussion. Uh, so this, the post-enumeration survey is, is our source of statistics, is a source of statistics on the undercount uh, and it's in data quality more generally. Um, you know, it's important, uh, importantly, it's the source of statistics on the underground by demographic group. I think that's of primary concern to the NAC. Uh, and, and as Tim uh told us the, the PES has a very long history and really has let us learn a lot about what procedures uh, are, are not doing well in terms of coverage and, and, and what are doing better. 
which means it's been a vital part of, uh, of, of improving census statistics. Um, and so I, I just want to be, uh, you know, um, um, thank the Bureau. <laughs> It, this is an amazing, amazing undertaking. I, I was thinking the only way to explain it to a general audience is you spend three years to do the census, and then the census says, let's do this again. And that's, that's really what happens. It's just an amazing thing, um, you know, that they uh, go back and, 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 and do this just, just to assess data quality. Uh, ne next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to talk, uh, just give you a little bit of an, uh, uh, I'm, I, what I tried to do because I was figured this was going to be complicated because it just is complicated. I tried to kind of strip this down so that uh, so that everybody, uh, even without a much of a technical background, might have at least a flavor of what this of what happens. So what's important is that the, the PEF is it's just an independent survey. Okay, so they go out and list people just like the census does, but without looking at what the census did. Um, it's the, I put some dates up here just to make it clear that it's happening, the, the fielding of the survey is, is happening after, largely after the census. And so there's going to be all kinds of issues that they're going to have to deal with, like uh, they want to know where you were on April 15th and you're not necessarily where you, uh, you know, where you are on October 12th, may not be where you were on the 15th. So there's a lot that goes on to try and figure out where, where people are. But once they uh, get all the data, here's sort of the trick, is that they they take everybody in the PES, I'm just giving you some numbers here, like 285 million people, and they say, okay, um, I'm going to take the set of people that are in the PES out of that, you know, take the set of people out of the PES, and I'm going to ask how many are, how many are, are, are found in the enumeration. And, and it turns out in 2010, it looks like almost everyone, 99.9874, these, these are really, really small numbers. Uh, but 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 that means about a little over 0.01% uh, uh, percent of people, in fact, are, are not found. So how do we get the estimate? Well, we look at the number of people in the census that are correctly enumerated. We we say, okay, if the PES is really a, think about it as just being a sample from a population and it's correct, well, you know, how many people that should have been there in the census weren't? Uh, we're going to assume that's how many people weren't in the census. So that that's kind of the layman's version. Of, of how of how this works. Um, uh, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so uh, I, I'm just going to concentrate on on just a very very small number of things. You know, the, as I said, the NAC is especially interested in the undercount minority uh, status. And what's really wonderful about about the PES is that they the kinds of things that you collect on the census you you also collect in the PES. So that's why you can. You can look at the undercount by by race and ethnicity and so forth, but I, I would just point out that the NAC actually is interested in a, in in, in uh, a, a lot of minority groups that we don't collect information on in the census. So I'll use this one example, and other people will have other examples. We don't really collect uh, sexual orientation on the census, but undercounts of sexual minorities, I, I, I think is important. I think other people think is important too. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and the truth is other federal surveys now collect this information. For a long time it wasn't collected, but the National Health Interview Survey has standard questions that collect it. So I'm going to throw out at least the idea that if we think on the NAC that, uh, that the, 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 the representation of other groups is important, um, that whether, you know, it's at least uh, suggest that maybe uh, if, if, if there are federal surveys that are collecting these things, that they might be added to the PES, even if they, they're not added to the census. It would really uh, help expand uh, uh, knowing uh, what coverage uh, is, is for other groups. The other thing I would say, you know, it's on everyone's mind, is what can we learn about uh, COVID's effects on the undercount and what can we learn about the differential effects by minority status. We know that the, uh, that the virus had differential effects uh, by more minority status. I suspect it had differential effects on how people move throughout the country as well. And, and without getting into too much inside baseball, I mean, the, the, the thing that I'm specifically concerned about is that you know, the, uh, is that the way this double estimation works is, is it's important that people uh, who are, who are uh, that there's no correlation between how hard people are to find in the census and how hard they are to find in the PES. And I think especially in, 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 this, in this year uh, with COVID, the same people being affected at the time of the census may have been affected at the time of the PES. So I think just think you need to be a little more careful than, than typical is what I would say. Um, next slide. Um, okay, 
So everything we've talked about is the main use of the PES. Clearly, it's the important use of the PES. But I want to bring up a secondary use of the PES, which I think would be uh, very, very valuable uh, for the NAC, which is what, what happens after the data is collected is that you can, you can, you can find the same person in the PES as in the census. There's a set of people that are in votes. And, and, and the truth is that there's, there's a, a lot of times we, we'd like to know something about the way people are answering questions on the census. Uh, so let me just give you a one example from my own work, which is, uh, which is it, it, it may seem like, why would you do this? But you may want to cross-tabulate how gender was answered on the census and how it's answered on the PES. And you might ask, well, well why do that? Um, and, and, and so we, let me just give you this as an example, which is, you know, suppose you, you, you went into the census and you found, um, found 1.5 million same-sex couples, okay? So lots of people are interested in, in, in fact, the Supreme Court was interested in these numbers when, 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 uh, when the um, uh, uh, marriage case came up. Um, and, 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 and the problem is the following is, is that there's two, way, you could, two ways in the census that you could report it as a same-sex couple. Either, either you're gay or, or lesbian, or you're a heterosexual couple that one of the people just checked the wrong box on gender. Okay, so that would be an example. Well, it turns out that if there's like a half a percent chance that that happens, like a third of the people that you think are gay and lesbian are not. So like knowing the accuracy of these, of these, uh, of these measures is really important. So that, that, that's not entirely a measurement issue, uh, you know, part of that's an identity issue. But how people answer the race question, I think, is really an identity issue. You know, they, they, like, you know, people, you know, how many people are giving more than one race on on the census, but only giving one on the PES or vice versa? And this, this is going to let us tell us a lot about the way people answer these questions. Um, and then finally, what I would what I would throw out as an idea is, and I know this has not been done, but it would be a, of enormous use if, if, if public use data from the PES could be released. You know, you've put all this effort into, into, into uh, collecting it, um, and if there was a way that a microdata file could be released, especially matched to the census records, it would be of enormous research use. And I, and I realize there may be uh, privacy considerations and so forth, so maybe a compromise would be to release it within the Census Bureau and the RDCs where, where researchers could actually help you, you know, could answer some of these questions. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, next, next slide, I think, is just the discussion. Okay, Th thank you, Jim. Thanks so much. I, I just made a, a, a goof and I, I was muted, but thanks so much, Seth and, and Michael. Um, we actually, we have one question while we're waiting for people to, um, you know, get in the queue. Um, would it be possible, Michael, for you to comment on the accuracy of the post-enumeration survey, given it's been significantly delayed because of the pandemic? And in particular, I think the concern is that um, obviously it, it's very common with, with surveys when you're asking people about past events that there can be recall error, um, that people forget who is or was living at their address on April 1st. So can you, can you also address that in terms of how you may be accounting for recall error, given the fact that some of what you're going to be doing with PES is happening, um, you know, several months after after the fact. Sure. Um, so it's very true that we are asking people um, about events that happened you know, a long time ago. April 1st, 2020 is our, our reference date, and we want to know the household composition as of that April 1st, 2020 date. And we're also interested in the household composition when we meet them there during the interview as well. And anyone who's moved in the household, who was in the household before and was not there, we're interested in people, you know, a year ago now, over a year ago, who were um, maybe living in two or, you know, many, many different housing units. They may have been going, you know, one day at one house, another day at another house, or a week in one house and another week in another house. And their residency is not as, you know, stabilize the, the bulk of the country. Um, and for us to ask questions about those timeframes is very difficult and is certainly subject to recall error and uh, what we call recall bias, when people either forget um, so that's sort of a non-response issue and they don't give us information at all. It's just so long ago, it's a gap in their, 
their mind. Um, and we're trying to mitigate that by having probes to remind people uh, what was happening during that time period. So when we go to do our interviews, we're giving them a sheet of paper that says, April 2020, here are the things that were happening. We had just started the pandemic, many people were locked down. Does that, you know, refresh your mind about who was living in your household and what was going on? So we're doing a lot of work within the interview trying to, you know, probe the respondents and give them as much help as possible um, to, to help them remember. We're also being very clear about our date. So rather than just saying April 1st, every time we ask a question dealing with April 1st, we're always saying 2020, the year, and, you know, establishing that, that time frame um, as well. Uh, but there, there is um, recall bias. People will say they moved earlier when they act, before April 1st when they actually moved after or, or vice versa. Um, and, you know, we're, we're trying as hard as we can in our interviews to overcome that. Uh, I will give a shout out to my colleagues in 2010. They did a recall bias study um, where they looked at, uh, they went to administrative records. So mm -hmm. the, the post office publishes this national change of, or, you know, they create a national change of address list. So when you move, you can fill out a form saying, I've moved, my address has changed. And they've compared that list to what the information we got from the post enumeration survey was um, with respect to the move dates, at least. And um, those are all online, and you can read those, those papers. Um, you know, there are debates within the Census Bureau of how, how strong that is and how much 2020 is different from 2010. Um, it, it's definitely a, a concern. And um, I'll say one more thing is uh, I'll go back to this idea that if we do have independence, at least between the, the census and the PES, some of the errors that we have can be overcome um, from leveraging, you know, the power of one survey can mitigate some of the, the errors in another survey. So we usually think about the PES as being, you know, sort of a, sometimes people think about the PES as being a, a perfect survey, you know, without any errors. And it's not that at all. It's not the truth. It's only combining it. And so the PES is definitely going to have errors with item non-response, unit non-response, recall error. The census has those. But if they're independent, we can put them together, you know, and um, have what I think will be, you know, very solid school system estimates. So thanks so much, Tim. And I, I actually see that you, you, you and Seth covered a lot of information in a very short period of time. But I also see that we are now Exactly, two minutes over. So with that, I think we're going to turn it back over to um, Karen to wrap us up for the day. Okay, so thank you very much for that discussion. So it's now time for a 10-minute break. Uh, but following the break, the MAC members will congregate amongst themselves to discuss and formulate recommendations. Uh, so this actually concludes the MAC spring virtual meeting proceedings for day one. So tomorrow we will begin with a presentation on the redistricting data program, followed by other important topics. So at this time, the WebEx session and audio will end, um, and the NAC will have offline discussions on today's topics. And James Tucker and Chair Keith Bradley will lead that NAC discussion and formulation of recommendations. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>